And then after that, Curtis Smith, are you here? Got it. Okay, why don't we go ahead and everybody stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Caitlin and Ryan Clevender are going to give lead us in the pledge from Jim Thorpe Fundamental School. Please go ahead. Raise your right, raise your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you can remain standing, please. Curtis Smith, our police chaplain, is going to give us our invocation. Honorable Mayor, members of the council, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen of the community, please bow for prayer. Lord God of all creation, we come into your holy presence, asking you to invoke the richness of your blessing upon this assembly on behalf of the great city of Santa Ana. For those leaders of the African American community who will be honored with exceptional service awards tonight for their outstanding contribution to the city, we are grateful. And thank you for their inspiration, performance, and their faithful unselfish service to the city and especially in recognition by proclamation of Black History Month. We pray for them your continued blessing of providential leadership and divine direction in their future undertakings on behalf of the city and for the benefit of all Santa Ana citizens. We ask you to bless the Honorable Mayor and this council body as they conduct the very important business this is on the agenda both in closed and in open sessions. Guide their actions that they will be positive and successful. May this city council meeting, which was opened by being called to order, be conducted expeditiously with dignity and adjourned in harmony. We pray in your holy name, eternal God. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, you may be seated. It is my honor today to recognize leaders of the African American community here in our beautiful city of Santa Ana. Um, many of you know who you are because you were invited, you received a letter. Please come on up at this time. Bobby McDonald, I see you there uh, at the front. Um, Alberta Christie, uh, Leon uh, is here, Al Murray. Everybody come on up. And, in a, and why don't I um, have uh, David Benavides join me at this time because um, in a moment he's going to make a presentation as well. Look, I'm going to read the names in a moment because this city is blessed uh, with many things, with... Uh, diversity with wonderful people and so many people from the African-American community that are associated with Santa Ana uh, make it uh, such a wonderful city. Let me read the names and in a few moments I want to say a little bit about what some of these people represent. Dr. Patricia Allegan, Jesse Allen, T. Leon Berry, I think I've known Leon for about how many years, Leon? Oh, you about about 12. 12? <laughs> Even, why don't we double up? Make two rows so we get more folks. It's not 12, Leon. 
You didn't, you, 12 times three. Um, Bob Black, uh, Howard Booker, Kathy Bauman, Alberta Christie, a former councilwoman, Reverend Leon Clark, Pastor Charles Coe, Devera Hurd, Leon Jacobs, Connie Jones. Where is Connie? Connie, I used to serve on a board with Connie many years ago. I don't know how many years ago, Connie, but like others, she's just amazing. Uh, uh, Bobby McDonald. Bobby is very active. Everywhere I go, there's Bobby. Uh, uh, Minister Paul McReynolds, and of course we remember his wonderful, wonderful father and all the great years of service to this community. May you rest in peace. Uh, Pastor Donald Miles, Bob Morris, Dottie Muckley, Al Murray. Is Al here? Al might be at a Tustin Council meeting. He's uh, mayor over there, but he's also very active here in Santa Ana. Uh, Pastor Gail Oliver, James D. Owens, Ned Owens, Pastor Ivan Bitts, Tyron Ship, James Stapleton, the African American community. Why don't you guys come up a little bit? They're taking photos and stuff, and uh, it'll look better. Um, the the Africa. There you go. It'll look. It'll be a better. Fo yeah, yeah. Like we're all friends. Like we all get. Yeah, yeah. We are. We are. We are, Bobby. We're all friends. We're all friends. Is Leon in the photo? <laughs> got two Leons. <laughs> All right, one of the Leons is. I'm, I won't pick on you, Leon. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the African American community have a long, long, exceptional history here in Santa Ana. Um, city is home to two uh, of the oldest black churches in Orange County, uh, the Second uh, Baptist Church and the, the Johnson Chapel AME Church. Second the Baptist Church celebrated their 91st anniversary, All right. 91 years. All right. Wait a minute, it says 91st anniversary in 2014. That means we're like at the 93rd anniversary. Um, Reverend Paul McReynolds is carrying on the legacy of his father, Reverend John Nix McReynolds, who passed away in 2011. And, and, and Reverend John McReynolds, like his son, just gave so much love and attention and, and a beautiful spirit to the city. Um, uh, Reverend John X. McReynolds was, was pastor of Santa Second Baptist Church since 1983 and a leader of the Orange County African American community. McReynolds was known for his singing and his passion and for helping youth. Is there a short song we could do? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Alberta said no, but I, we were starting to get something going there. Um, Reverend John Nix McReynolds once said, Our church has always stood in the forefront of being an activist fellowist, fellowship that cares about the common people. The church carries a message of hope to everyone who is trying to find their way through the malaise of darkness that exists in this society. Second Baptist Church continues to be active in celebrating civil rights. Recently, they celebrated their 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act during a gathering at the Second Baptist Church. T. Leon Berry. What does the T stand for, Leon? Tall, tan, tall, tan, and terrific. Thomas as well, but Todd Tannen, terrific. That's good, and that was fast. Uh, he's a Santa Ana civil rights leader. He joined the Johnson uh, Chapel AME Church in 1974, and he drives 60 miles to go to church each Sunday. It's good that you drive, but you just move closer, Leon. Um, former council member Alberta Christie was the first elected African-American official in the history of Santa Ana. Let's give Alberta an applause. Thank you, Alberta. Alberta was instrumental in the creation of the city's new youth commission and she was a strong advocate for programs aimed at promoting the positive development of young people 
such as the Youth Expo, and, and, and Alberta was just always and continues to be just a, a, an integral part of this community and so loving and so caring. Tyrone Ship comes to, from a family of role models in his family, including his, his aunt, Helen Ship, co-founder of the Black History Parade in Santa Ana. And I know that Councilwoman Michelle Martinez, I think, was talking about bringing the, the Tet Parade back and maybe also the Black History Parade back to Santa Ana. <laughs> maybe we can do that. Um, uh, he initiated the annual 4th of July neighborhood block party, which comprises a full day of activities, food, fun for families, children. This important event focuses on creating safe uh, space for families and neighbors to socialize, work together, build trust in a family-oriented setting. Uh, Dorothy Muckley, part of the landmark civil rights ruling of Muckley versus Reitman in 1967. Muckley and her husband Lincoln were denied the ability to rent an apartment by a landlord in Orange County because they were African American. The case went to the Supreme Court where it was ruled that the Muckleys uh, in, in their favor and overturned Proposition 14 which meant landlords no longer could refuse to rent to people because of the uh, skin color, religion, or ethnicity. Howard Booker a teacher here in Santa Ana would make his own tests, quizzes, and fact sheets about U.S. history with information rarely featured in historic in, in his story books. Connie Jones, uh, she is the granddaughter of Anne May Tripp, who founded the Southwest Community Center in 1971. Let's give Connie an applause. The greater part of Connie's adult life has been spent working in the community as a servant of the underserved and low-income individuals and families that reside in Orange County. Connie has served as Executive Director of the Southwest Community Center, known as the Center, since 1984. Prior to assuming that position as Executive Director, she worked in various positions there, initially starting as a cook back in 1979. Uh, the center conducts various uh, services for low-income families and individuals, among them serving hot meals daily, distributing food, clothing, and, and household items. The staff also provides rental and utility assistance to, to those who are about to be evicted or face a disconnection of utilities. And look, these are some of the individuals that we highlighted but every single person standing up here um, and others that they represent uh, just have given so much for so many years to the city that it is appropriate to give each and every one of them a certificate of recognition because they are indeed uh, exceptional service award recipients. They are, they're all givers. They're all people that don't say, what's in it for me? They say, how can I help others? How can I help a difference? How can I help make Santa Ana a better place? So what I'd like to do at this moment is turn things uh, over for a moment to my uh, colleague, Councilman David Benavides. He has a presentation to make. And then I don't know if there's somebody that wishes to say a few words. If, if there is, I'd like to have somebody from the group say a few words. Bobby, you're right here. Alberta's right here. Let's, let's let David go first, and then we'll take some comment, please. Thank you, Mayor, and it's great to be here among so many familiar faces and so many friends, uh, people that are, you know, just love our city and, and are, are committed to serving our city and in various capacities uh, serving uh, the beautiful city of Santa Ana. And I think one of the wonderful things about our city is, is our diversity. Um, we, we are at this point about 80% Latino, but uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I grew up in a, in a pretty much, a, uh, not, not in the city of Santa Ana, but a very pretty much monocultural uh, uh, community and, and uh, as a Latino and I, and I love my, my, my Latino and, and Mexican roots uh, but it was in college when I had an opportunity to interact and exchange with, with people of, of different backgrounds my first roommate was African American my, my second roommate uh, was, was Anglo and once I started uh, interacting with people of, of uh, just different uh, backgrounds it, it enriched my, my own perspective my own life and so coming to the city of Santana and seeing 
an African-American community that continues to, to be strong uh, here in the city and uh, Asian community as well that's growing. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it enriches our, our, our young people and, and their experience and, and uh, the diversity is something that's precious and, is, and special. Uh, it, what we've done for the last number of years is uh, to recognize February as Black History Month and actually independently of each other, Mayor was uh, looking to, to recognize a number of, of terrific leaders that, are, that have joined us here. And also was, was uh, looking at uh, uh, recognizing that the, uh, having the city recognize Black History Month, uh, something that I've had an opp opportunity to do since uh, pretty much uh, joining the council eight years ago, and something that I followed after the, the, uh, my, my predecessor, Councilwoman uh, Alberta Christie, who, who was uh, very much committed to serving our community, as, as uh, was mentioned uh, a bit ago, and has been a, a recognized leader within, uh, the, uh, within Orange County at large, but, but a, a great representative of the African American community. Uh, what we've done is we've had individuals from different uh, uh, segments of the community, whether it be uh, uh, business or, or, or church leaders, uh, uh, the community leaders uh, receive the proclamation on behalf of the community. And today I thought it'd be appropriate to have uh, um, our, our now retired Councilwoman uh, Alberta Christie receive this proclamation, uh, recognizing again her, uh, uh, her contributions, but, but also being that pioneer African American uh, elected official in the city of, of Santa Ana, hopefully just the, the, the first of many, so those of you, you know, who are here joining us, you know, uh, uh, we have elections coming up in a, in a, in a couple years, and, and then I'll be uh, uh, retiring uh, in, in a couple years after that, and so hopefully we'll be able to see uh, you all join and continue to serve uh, our city in that capacity. Uh, what, what this proclamation here uh, recognizes is, again, uh, that there, there's quite a bit of history uh, that, that uh, is presented with regard to Black History Month in, in this country. Uh, but it also highlights a number of, of uh, just contributions that uh, the African American community has made both uh, nationally and, and, uh, and, uh, and here locally. Uh, so I, I, I won't go into uh, uh, reading all of the details here, but uh, Alberta, if you, if you would come and, and receive this proclamation, and again, we, we thank you and want to honor you uh, as you've been a leader for, for many here, uh, uh, standing with us and so many out there and a great role model uh, to our young people. Uh, thank you, uh, Alberta. Thank you, all of you uh, leaders, for your, your commitment to our community. And again, want to present this uh, proclamation recognizing Black History Month here in the city of Santa Ana. Thank you, Alberta. Put it down. <laughs> or put the mic down so you can get a photo. Thank you. It is such an honor on behalf of the African American community here in Santa Ana to accept this proclamation and to thank you for honoring all these leaders behind, behind me. You know, we have a saying that we stand on the shoulders of others. That if, you know, where we are today is that through our grandparents, our great-grandparents, through their struggle to make a better life for us. So we're standing on their shoulders, and our children and grandchildren today will be standing on ours. And it's reflected that the African-American community got its start here in Santa Ana. And as Santa Ana has developed, you know, when I was on the council, people looked to us because of the input of all of our community leaders, and especially the African American community, to resolve whatever issue there was that affected that community. And like I say all the time, what happens here in Santa Ana, we are Santa Ana, and we are the ones that solve our neighbors to the north, south, east, and west, their problems. They look for us for leadership, and they look for us for that future of moving their communities forward. So I am proud, thank you so much for honoring black history. And once again, thank you for these leaders behind me. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Dr. Devera Hurd, and thank you very much for honoring us. I do not want to leave this evening without reminding you, as uh, Mayor Polito just mentioned, that it's time for the Black History Parade. The Black History Parade is now in Anaheim, and it's in downtown Anaheim. It's this Saturday, the 7th. The parade steps off at 10 o'clock, and immediately following is the cultural fair. And it's really important time because it's not just for African Americans. It's for all people to understand how important financially, culturally, um, in education, making this county the beautiful, viable place it is. So we hope that all of you will all be there. We hope all of you will take the time to come to the Black History Parade and Cultural Fair this Saturday. And again, thank you. Um, <clears throat> My name is Tall. <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, thank Mayor Polito and uh, for opening up the portals once again uh, in order to create a relationship between the black community and uh, Santa Ana. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, just, just kind of to Bobby. We're going to uh, just hand these out, and if you can help us um, get them to folks, uh, we'll just do that. Um, And um, uh, I think we've taken a few photos. Look, this is very, very important to us. And yes, I, you know, right now the parade's in Anaheim, but maybe in 2016 we can bring it back to Santa Ana. Because it was here in Santa Ana for many years. Many, 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 many years. Anybody else wish to speak? Connie, any words of wisdom, please? You have words of wisdom. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Mayor and the City Council members. I would just like to thank him for the honor of uh, allowing my community center to be recognized uh, because of the legacy that I stood on the shoulders of the giant of Anime Trip. She's the one that created. She's the one that had the vision. And we're in our 43rd year. We feed about 100,000 meals a month. I mean, 100,000 meals a year, and there's no way we could do it without the support of volunteers and people like you all that come in and support our organization. And I'd just like to thank you for the recognition. And when our building burnt, if it hadn't been for the community, we wouldn't still be standing doing the work we do. Thank you, and God bless you all. Hey Amen. Once again, I want to thank uh, Mayor Polito and, and Councilman David Benavides. We have, uh, we started a program called Love Santa Ana, teaching Santa Ana how to love one another, how to love your neighbors. Uh, we had our first program September 21st. We have the next one on Valentine's Day, and we're meeting at Willard. What's the time again? 7.30 a.m. at Willard Junior High School. All those who want to come out and help love on that neighborhood, you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. Come on out. We want to, we're going to love on Santa Ana. All those who are proud to be a, a citizen of Santa Ana, clap your hands real quick. Give Santa Ana a big hand. Show Santa Ana some love. All right, uh, somebody told me to say it's a hook, help us, help you, we're all helping each other. Thank you. From Comlink, Comlink says, help us, help you. Okay? Thank you. All right, with that, we're going to go on to the consent counter. I'm going to go back. Is there any other presentation? All right.
as um, as uh, we conclude presentations, and um, you know, we just had um, celebrating Black History Month for those that are at home and there in the audience. Um, you know, on Christmas Day, we all know that the movie Selma came out, and 50 years ago, you know, um, African Americans had the right to vote. And as we're celebrating this special occasion here with our African American leaders here in Santa Ana and in Orange County, it's important to recognize why it's so important to, to, to vote in this country and the right that we have. And so I just want to encourage many, I've encouraged the Yost uh, Theater and, and Frida Cinema to bring Salma to Santa Ana. I think it's a very important and powerful movie. I went all the way to Los Angeles to watch it on Christmas Day because I knew the importance of that movie and how long it took to come out. And so I just want to encourage the residents of Santa Ana to go out and, and support the movie Salma. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm going to bring our attention to the consent calendar and ask the city attorney, is there anything to report out of closed session, please? Mayor, we address three um, workers' comp um, litigation matters in closed session. I do have reportable action for you. In the case of Marco Zavala, the council approved on a motion um, of 6-0 with Tina Harrow absent, uh, a, a settlement of $37,414.50. With respect to Enrique Rubalcava versus City of Santa Ana, another workers' compensation case, the council approved on a 7-0 vote. Uh, settlement of $37,803.79. And in the final matter of Wallace Shearing versus the city in a workers' comp case, the council approved in a 7-0 vote um, a, a settlement of $75,000. And that's all I have to report. All right. So with that, we'll continue. And Madam Clerk, I'm now going to go to the consent calendar, therefore. Uh, on the consent calendar, are there any items that council members wish to pull or abstain uh, on? Mayor, I'd like to pull 19C. All right, let's note that. Any other items? I'd entertain a motion on the balance. So move. A second. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. 19C, please. Mayor, I totally apologize. I also wanted to pull 25A, so it's my, too late. My apologies. It's okay. Just it's very okay. quickly. Let's just, do 19C and then I'll. Yes, we'll, I just had comment on 19C and 25A. 19C is a request for proposal for the arts and culture master plan, and I just wanted to highlight to the community and wanting to thank the arts and culture commission and our staff for moving us forward with our commitment of our five-year strategic plan and embarking on this master plan as we go out for RFP. I did have comment for staff in regards to resource assessment. I'm just wanting to make sure that uh, we're able to ask the consultant when we're looking at resources to funding art that we also look at not only private investment but also possibly some, um, some initiatives that we can possibly go out to the voters and then also the development community as it pertains to art because no matter where I go whether it's San Francisco or if it's Seattle or New York, there's always a fee as it pertains to art. And I'm not saying we're going to move in that direction, but I think we need to look at all those options as we look at art and culture. And so I just wanted to uh, make that nod. I saw in the, RF, um, the RFP that it was just resource assessment. And so just wanting to make sure that it's just not internally from the city council trying to look at getting funds. I know we talked earlier, I had a, a meeting with the city manager and possibly looking at 1% in the future. And those are conversations that we're having, but we also need to make sure that we're able to um, get investment from the private community and looking at other initiatives in that direction. So with that, I move the item. Is there a second? Second. second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Uh, you also wanted to talk about 20A? 25A, Mayor, yes. Okay. And this is another commitment in our five-year strategic plan, moving um, with the uh, first citywide economic development strategic plan. Um, this went through our uh, Finance, Economic, and Development Committee. And again, making a commitment, I want to thank our, t our business task force that um, um, has come together and our staff and, and, and my colleagues that sit with me on the Finance, Economic, and Technology Committee as we went through this process. Um, I, I have to tell you that um, when this is um, completed and we start the actual process with the consultants in the community and various business groups, that it is my hope and in the... And in the RFP, if, if, if my colleagues um, did take a look at that and, and the folks in the, in the audience, you will notice that we're wanting to tie this economic strategic uh, plan 
to our, which is very important to our general plan, making sure that we're compatible with economic development and how we plan. It is very imperative, important as we move our city forward. And so this is a very positive step for the city of Santa Ana. And I want to thank our staff, our city manager, and my colleagues again for moving this in this direction because it's been needed for a very long time in this city where we're able to connect the dots. And I really believe we're moving in that direction. With that being said, I-, I Is there a I second? Know. Second. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Uh, Madam Clerk, I believe that brings us to our business calendar. So I want to entertain a motion on. Um, actually, before I do 55A, somebody wants to speak on it. Let me uh, hear from the audience and then we'll talk. Uh, right, Mr. Mayor? 55A, yes. 55A first. Absolutely. Okay. All right, go ahead, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. On, uh, I think on 55A, what, for consistency purposes, I think maybe we should join that with 65C because that's an issue that we have to address and that's pending. All and right. I think they're related. So if we move to 65A and 65B, I would simply request that we put those matters over because we still have uh, conversations to have with our staff. All right. So is that a motion on 65A uh, and B, is it? Or, yes. or, or, or all three? 65A and B. No, all right. Sir. There's a motion and a second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed, aye. motion carries unanimously. And so you want to tie uh, uh, 55A 55 and 65C. Correct. Why don't we hear from a speaker on 55A and then we'll take it up together with, um, uh, you know, uh, 65C. 55A, uh, Steve uh, McGuigan. Is Steve out back maybe? May we leave him out back? <laughs> if he's not here, we'll just... Um, Wait a minute, there's an effort by the community to contact him. Community has succeeded. They've made contact for those people at home. Steve is now walking towards the microphone. Here he is. Sorry. Go ahead. You're on the checkpoint twice. Fifty five A, Steve, that's what you're talking about. Fifty five A, I would sorry about my voice. I'll I'll try and do this as well as I can. Um, I just ask that you do it after 65C. We are. Okay, that's, we're done. Thank Boy, you. That was short. Thank you. All right. 65C then. We have Ann uh, Salisbury that wishes to speak. Followed by Debbie Muse, I believe, M-U-I-S-E. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and fellow City Council members. I'm here tonight to ask you to retain the status quo with regard to the Park Ranger program. Yes, you need to replace the people, but you don't need to take the radical step of replacing the program. I'd like to clarify some misunderstandings. The proposed option A will not maintain the same level of service. It replaces 100 hours of park, ranger pro, of park Ranger time with only 40 hours of police officer time. The Park Rangers currently patrol the parks seven days a week. Can you move closer to the mic? The Park Liaison Officer would work only four days a week. Those are the facts, but let's talk about the nitty-gritty of the implementation. This past September, a young lady home from college and her friends were out walking at night when they were beaten and robbed at Jack Fisher Park. In response to neighborhood concerns, the park rangers were given permission to work overtime, and they formulated a plan to remove the negative elements from the park. Every night for two weeks after the park closed, one ranger was stationed in a hidden place in the park with other rangers nearby working as backup. The ranger in the park would radio the backup unit whenever there were people in the park. The rangers would move in, freeze everyone, sort out what they had, including doing warrant checks. They issued citations and gave stern warnings to the people to not come to the park for illegal activities. Unless you think this was a north of 17th Street privilege, it was not. The rangers used a similar operation to catch people stealing copper wire and otherwise vandalizing Memorial Park when there were problems there. Such sting operations could not be replicated with police officers because we simply don't have enough of them and they have more important calls to attend to. 
Because the rangers are less expensive than our police officers, these park protection operations are uniquely within their scope of responsibility. No one would ask an ambassador to hang around unarmed in a dark park after hours seeking out those who would cause trouble. And for those of you concerned with guns in parks, your real dispute is with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal, not the park rangers. After the Ninth Circuit mandated the expansion of concealed carry permits, the question is not whether there will be guns in parks. The question is who will have them. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> Debbie, and then after Debbie, uh, Randy Elridge, please. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Tonight, when you are deciding on whether or not to continue the Santa Ana Park Rangers, please also consider the safety of our park goers, especially the children. Santa Ana, being the fourth densest city in the United States, makes our parks safe safety essential to the well-being of our children, many of whom live in apartments without green space. I have difficulty in believing a park ambassador whose only requirements are age 18 or older, high school diploma or GED, and one year working with the public will be able to handle many of the situations in the parks without calling the Santa Ana Police Department. Situations that include dealing with the homeless, the mentally ill, gangs, as well as reserved fields. Will the park ambassador call the Santa Ana police? Will the ambassador wait around until the Santa Ana police arrive? This will impact both the workload of the Santa Ana police department and the safety of our parks. While most of the park calls are priority four or five to the Santa Ana police department, they are a high priority to both the Santa Ana park visitor and the Santa Ana residents who live nearby the park. Our park rangers are mostly retired Santa Ana Police Department, which means they have received extensive training on how to handle the public in difficult situations as well as laws, fire, firearms, etc. They also have many years of experience in both police and park ranger duties, which makes them invaluable when faced with a difficult situation in our parks. Please, for the safety of Santa Ana's residents, keep the Santa Ana Park Rangers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Muse. Randy Elridge, followed by Rory Smith. Mr. Eldridge, your, the floor is yours. Thank you for allowing me to speak. You notice my shirt says Santa Ana. It's where my story begins. My family has been in Santa Ana uh, before Santa Ana was incorporated. We have a lot of history in the family on my mother's side. Uh, Beverly Street is named after my mother. Uh, she was Miss Santa Ana in 1943, and uh, Colonel William W. Eldridge Park is named after my dad, and my ancestors were downtown business people. So my concern with the, with the city is uh, not about making money as a park ranger uh, sergeant, which is what I do. It's all about taking care of Santa Ana and keeping them safe. I have a lot of loyalty to the city and my family still lives in the city and I wanted to just address a few issues about um, having us leave uh, before we're actually replaced with uh, the park ambassadors if that's what your decision is. I want you to think about the fact that there's going to be nobody there to train them to show them the best ways to get in and out of the parks, which parks are have what kinds of issues and so forth. They're going to lose all of this knowledge that my current park rangers have. When they hired, I, well, I retired from San Ana PD after 30 years, and they hired me a couple of months later. When I, when I first came, I recognized the fact that when I was the Northeast Sergeant for the Police Department, that um, there were only three full-time park rangers patrolling all of the parks. And so my lieutenant at the time came to me and said, I want you to assign each and every one of your officers to patrol the parks on the Northeast District, especially Santiago Park and uh, Fisher Park and, um, and Portola Park because of some of the problems they were having at the time. So I gave my officers that directive and the problem was the lieutenant would come to me and say, I don't see them patrolling the parks. How come they're not patrolling the parks? So I pulled all of their 
all of their um, daily logs and sat them down and asked, you know, what's the problem? How come you're not going through them? And they showed me that call after call after call, and the only time they could have gone to the park was during their lunchtime. So they asked me, you want me to eat my lunch in the park? I'll do that, but that's the only chance I can get. He said, I get up there a couple of times, and I almost get into the park, and they would reassign me another call. And that was when the police department had just under 500 police officers, and now we're dealing with around 300 police officers. And I know that when my guys log on currently as a park ranger onto the computer, because we're dispatched by the PD and our calls are sent on our computer by the police department, you'll see page after page after page of pending calls. What I worry about is when they call for some of the things that may not seem important to some people, but are important to the people that use the parks, smoking, in the park, smoking marijuana in the Randy, park. Randy, if you could wrap up, the light is okay. red. Uh, I worry that uh, that uh, they're not going to get that service because they're going to be way down low in their priorities. Thank you for your service and thank you for your comments, You're Randy. Welcome. Thanks for much. letting me speak. Absolutely. Rory Smith followed by Mario Villalobos. Good morning, Council. Um, Having the fact that having the park range available to us in our parks in the city of Santa is a tremendous effort for us because the fact that we can have people that we can call that can come and service us during our youth sports is invaluable. I understand Santa PD does a great job in what they do, but we also understand that they're not a high priority call when it comes to, comes to calls regarding the park. Everyone knows with Prop 47, with all the narcotics being a misdemeanor, theft under, nine, over, under 950 is a misdemeanor, and all of AB 109 has been released, our parks are now filled with a lot more criminals. Sending someone out there without a gun, without the training experience, is going to just going to devastate what happens to all our youth leagues in Santa Ana and the people that just want to walk their kids, play with their families in the parks. So with all due respect, I'd appreciate it if you guys really consider keeping our armed officers in the um, cities of Santa Ana for the parks and rangers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rory. Mario Villalobos, followed by Car Carlos Nava. Good evening, council members. My name is Mario Villalobos. I'm the current president of Santa Ana Pop Warner. Um, just come to speak in regards to the issue with uh, removing the park rangers. Before you make your decision, I urge you just think about the, the safety of the kids first and foremost. As a board member, as a volunteer, that's my most important issue is the safety of the kids. Um, replacing our park rangers with uh, an ambassador. They, they will not have the training that our park rangers have to deal with, with any issues that may arise. Um, the the knowledge that our park rangers have, as, as Mr. Smith said, is invaluable to our community. Um, so let's first and foremost just think of the safety of, of our kids. At any time we have anywhere from 200 to 400 participants in our program at our park. Um, that's not counting parents and that's practices. Any time on game days we have anywhere from 150 to 300 kids um, at our program. So just take that into consideration when you make your decision tonight. Um, again, as, as Mr. Smith touched on, the AB 109 Realignment Act, Prop 47, there's just there's more activity at our parks, and not having our park rangers there could be, uh, I mean, just, con just thinking about it, um, I mean, thinking about what could happen to, to any, any of our kids or any of our uh, park goers. Um, I mean, I just <laughs> I would hate to think what could happen. So take that in consideration. I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me come up here and speak. So have a good Thank day. you for your comments, Mario. Carlos Nava, followed by Mike Lopez, followed by Steve McGuigan, if he's still around. There he is. Good evening, members of City Council. Thanks for letting me talk. My name is Carlos Nava. I've been a resident for 15 years here in the city of Santa Ana. I am the former president of Santa Ana Pony Baseball and uh, was the president of Santa Ana Little League. I am a police officer for a local large agency. I've been working there for 15 years, so I, I know a lot of the problems that big cities have with patrolling parks. I'm an advocate for option C of the plan of hiring new armed uh, park rangers and keeping the program that we have in place and adding to it because hiring seasoned police officers to come and work over uh, an ambassador, I just ha the, the pros outweigh the cons by far, in my opinion. 
Uh, I personally witnessed the positive impact of our current park rangers that they have on our parks and the residents. They know us, they know our problems, they know uh, the problem uh, people that come to the parks. They're very responsive and we appreciate what they do very much. Uh, already talked about that. Option A, in my opinion, is really not an option. An ambassador, they're going to have a radio or cell phone, they're going to call the police and I think just about any other citizen can do that if there's a problem at the park. So. We're just adding an extra step to the process. Let's have somebody there that can proactively patrol our parks and uh, solve the problem before it actually happens. Uh, oftentimes our police officers want to do district car checks of our local parks, but they just don't have the time. And like somebody else was saying, our numbers are down. We're at least down a third of our patrol officers here in Santa Ana, and they're already overburdened as it is. And they, I think they want to do that job. I think they'd love to go out and patrol our parks. They just can't. They just don't have the time. Uh, let's see. Again, I recommend it to go to option C. I believe it's best for what the city of Santa Ana, uh, I'm sorry, it's best for the Santa Ana residents. And it falls, it falls in line with the five-year strategic plan. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me, and I hope you consider option C. Thank you. <laughs> Mike Lopez, followed by Steve McGuigan again. Steve, you, are, you spoke earlier. You want to speak again? Yes, sir. Yes or what? Yes. You want us to go again? All right, go ahead, Mike. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Mike Lopez, and I am the, here representing SCIU, Service Employees International Union, Local 721, Santa Ana Chapter, and we are in favor of keeping the Park Ranger program. In case anyone is trying to see the connection between SCIU and why it's so important to keep the Park Ranger program, let me explain. With 40 parks, miles of bike trails, the Municipal Stadium, and 16 community centers, all managed by Park and Recreation, there are hundreds of employees, both full-time and part-time, who are embedded into these facilities and whose purpose is to serve the community. For those of us who have been with the city for so many years, we view ourselves as not just serving the community, but we are a part of the community. We arrive each day looking forward to continue our long-lasting relationships with the numerous people we have befriended over the years, and we look forward to opportunities to build fresh new relationships with people who are new to our parks. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we are a part of the community and what affects them directly affects us. The Park Ranger program was proven itself over the years to be an effective community-based program whose mission is to proactively keep our community's kids, families, athletes, employees, and our guests safe and free from worry about encountering potentially dangerous or harmful experiences. In other words, the Park Ranger program has created a park environment where people feel safe to visit the park, enjoy whatever recreation or leisure activity they desire. An indication of the success is the number of people who are here this evening. But as I mentioned at the last council meeting, our parks haven't always been that safe. Last council meeting, I recalled a point in our park and rec history when the Park Ranger force was down to only three full-time employees. And the, least, and the police department, as well-intentioned as they were, and you heard this from Sergeant Eldridge, offered to help by directing their patrol officers to patrol the parks when time was available. Well, the truth was that the PD simply was so busy that they rarely, if ever, made it to the parks. What resulted within a short period of time was a crime began infiltrating back into the parks. Madison Park, for example, began seeing drug dealers, prostitutes, and the local gang began their practice of collecting taxes from those who wished to do business on their turf. And several other parks throughout the city began experiencing similar negative activities. Thankfully then, as today, the community rose up and the city responded favorably by beginning to hire park rangers again. Then shortly thereafter, it was decided to begin hiring the retired SAPD uh, officers, and this really gave a professional boost to the park ranger program. Now let's bring us up to today. We are down to five part-time park rangers, and some of them are getting ready to uh, accept other positions, I understand. According to Southeast Little League official, a few weeks ago, the president was volunteering at Madison Park, their home field. He was outside the concession building when several gang members approached him, allegedly gang members, and demanded that he be, they'd be let into the building. He refused, and he was seriously assaulted. Mike, can you... Uh Please conclude soon. Yes, Honorable Mayor, City Council members, we're advocating here tonight to keep the Park Ranger program. Thank you very much. Thank you.
After Jim, we have Larry Klein, followed by uh, Teresa Dugan. Dugan. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to speak again. I think that our answer actually lies somewhere between options B and C. I think it's important that our current park rangers be kept on a little bit longer, first in order to train any upcoming rangers, but that, the, but that the program itself, that the park ranger program remain intact. It's been an important part of what we do in our parks and keeping all of our park programs safe. There's been a lot of talk about a lot of different reasons why things need to be changed up. I've heard the argument about the guns, the armed officers. Imagine how frightening it is for a Santa Ana resident to hear council members say that it's frightening for former Santa Ana police members to have guns. As Councilmember Martinez pointed out, Santa Ana Police Department gets some of the highest level training and you guys make a significant investment in their abilities. For them not to have guns, for them not to be the ones patrolling our parks, we don't want second tier. We want the top guys and that's what we've got. I've worked with these guys for years. They do a fantastic job. They know what they're doing. It's very important to us that we keep a park ranger program. There is a use for an ambassador program, but an ambassador program is not a replacement for the park rangers. They have very, very different functions. Now, I know that there are some issues with the CalPERS program. AB 1028 has a very specified process for getting an extension, should you decide to get an extension for it. I realize these guys have been on it for a while and have been going through it, but if you wanted an extension at this point, bear with me while I describe for you the process. You send the PERS board a letter describing what goes on. That's it. The Cal's PERS board will give you a thumbs up or thumbs down as to whether or not you can keep these guys. I don't know if this has been done. Perhaps one of you could ask staff. We need to know that every possible opportunity has been had to try and keep these guys in service because they do such a good job. Now, AB 340 affects people hired after January 1st, 2013, and all these guys have come after that, or have come before that. Lastly, let me just burn the rest of my time by thanking the officers. I know some of them are here tonight, but I don't know if the park rangers will get thanks for what they do. They're due to go away on the 18th. I think it's very important that we recognize all of their hard work and service, and for everything they've done for us over the years, I want to thank them on behalf of the residents I represent, the organizations I represent, and me personally for the fantastic job they've done. Please try and keep these guys if you can, but definitely keep the park ranger program for all of our residents. After Larry, we have Teresa, or Therese, after that, we, after her, we have Eric uh, Skanderet, please. Please go ahead, Larry. Thank you. Uh, I just have one thing to say. I'm in favor of the third option C. I think if you do vote to keep the park ranger program and use the retired deputy sheriffs, you no longer have a CalPERS problem. And to me, that's the biggest obstacle in keeping the park rangers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Therese, followed by Eric, followed by Rick and Niedermeyer. Good evening, everyone. I'm Therese Duggan Trevitt, and I live up in Morrison Park. And you can see, has an issue galvanized us more to come and visit and observe the workings of the city council. And so the park rangers are really important. We want them to stay armed, and we want the city and the leadership here to solve this issue with posting and hiring positions to keep the park rangers armed and in the parks of Santa Ana. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, followed by Rick, followed by Monica Suter. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. And I just wanted to take a minute this evening to thank the Mayor and the Council persons who last week voted in favor of keeping the park rangers. I know that you, you have spent a lot of time studying this issue. And for those that are not on board to keep the park rangers, I would urge you to Think back and listen to what was said by your fellow council people and the mayor last week or last meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Followed by Monica, followed by Glenn Stroud. Good evening, everybody. Let's move this up a little bit. Um, I've done a lot of research on this 
topic from the last six hours today. And I've gone back to the LA Times 1990 when the uh, park rangers were voted for by a 5-0 vote of the city council to be armed. And there's, there's a lot of stuff in here that's really interesting. Um, first of all, it says if the park rangers, we, we place them under the supervision of the police department as well as the park and rec. Well, it seems like everything is now park and rec. It's not police department. So if they shared the responsibility, maybe we wouldn't be here at this today. Um, number two, at that time in 1990, we had five permanent park rangers and eight part-time rangers. Now, now we're five part-time rangers. City hasn't lost people. It's, it's grown. But yet we're cutting back on that. Um, one of the city council members last week, or excuse me, two weeks ago, it rec had mentioned about the um, having park ranger, armed park rangers and the safety with guns in the park. Well, um, David Rain was our city manager many years ago, and there's a quote in here that said, the park ranger, if the park rangers are equipped with guns, they will be assigned police department to the police department to make sure that the adequate weapons supervision, current rangers undergo 360 hours of reserve officer classes, which include firearm training. So they are receiving that. Um, you talked about the ambassador program. And you're putting, I think you're putting a 18 or 20 or 22 year old young man or young woman out there with a target on their back and no way to defend themselves. Um, in uniform, they were a target. Um, other cities have had a similar instance where the uh, park rangers have been in a city logoed vehicle, and now they become a target too, and they have no way to defend themselves. Um, city council up here is, is uh, voted by our constituents in their war or in the city to represent a ward, and we've been up here for three city council meetings, and, I, and sometimes I wonder if you guys hear what the public wants, what's best, what we want, not what's best, what you think is best, but what we want. And I question that sometimes. Uh, we live in a city, you guys live in a city, but you should be accepting what we ask for and trying to find the best way to approach that and have that happen. Uh, we also talked about uh, cities. Uh, I have a quote here. Los Angeles uh, Rangers are among the few agencies in California that are not armed. Rangers in Yosemite, San Francisco, San Jose, Oakland, Sacramento, Glendale, Sunnyvale, Long Beach, and Santa Ana all have park rangers that are carrying firearms. So it's not, a, it's not one city or two cities. One of our city council members, uh, I met with them last week, and they asked why. Why should we have park rangers armed? We're unique. We're a city that has people that, were, that come into our city that maybe they come in because for no good. We need to have armed park rangers to take care of our kids and protect us. I see a thread. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Rick. Monica Suter, followed by Glenn Stroud, followed by Thomas Anthony Gordon. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Monica Suter, and I'm also here representing the Service Employees International Union workers and the community that we very proudly serve. We are in support of Option B with Option C, with some recommended modifications to Option C. And we also recommend that option C be clarified to provide for any PERS, uh, non-PERS annuitant so that that issue is never an issue in the future with a combination of enforcement and community service background to be eligible to apply. Related to option C, we further recommend that the park rangers be housed out of their current parks and rec location. That's important to be tied in with a proactive enforcement and the community that they serve and so to ensure that parks will remain their highest priority. So given that the city has indicated our budget is actually in very good shape now comparatively, we also re recommend that the city expand rather than disband the park ranger program. Seems like a good time to do that. And as was pointed out, <laughs> as was pointed out, we used to have five full-time and was it three part-time uh, part or maybe it was, I, I might be off on, that, on those numbers, but in any case, that's critical to remember that history, and I think we, we're having a lot of issues come up these days. So we concur with the prior council member comments that were said, referring to only having five 20-hour-a-week 
park rangers responsible for 40 parks and of course their joint use facilities. That is no small task. In fact, they've done an incredible job. We would like to see them given service awards for their fine work and to immediately rescind their layoff notices that were given to them prior to this council policy change decision. So there's been no council policy change decision yet they've been laid off as of December. And that's of concern to the community, all of us. So these notice, notices were issued in December and now they're leaving in two weeks. Meanwhile, we do not have a city council policy decision yet um, because this is an important issue and it needs to be fully processed. And further, uh, we have no one trained and in place to uh, take on their duties really for you know, a 40 hour a week liaison person who may be partially out of the office, partially at the parks, it, and 10 hour days, four 10 hour days is not the same as, as being able to cover the peak hours of the parks. So, um, and also there's only uh, about 300 out of the 600 need we heard at the last council meeting of uh, police officers. So they, if they're 50% staffed at a 50% staffing level rather than 100%, the likelihood of them being able to prioritize parks is probably not realistic. Um, so, and then with the uh, remaining park ranger who is not a par uh, PERS annuitant, he could become full-time to fill the position of the one gentleman that just recently received another offer. And I think it's been hard for our park rangers to be hung in the balance a few times. Back in um, January 2014, and by the way, this has never really been about the park ranger's specific positions. It's really been about that they're truly worried and concerned about the community because they really value our community. But the plan was to hire uh, new park ranger replacements, and that was the goal. So we'd like to get back to that with option C and those modifications recommended. Thank you very much Thank for you. your time. Glenn, followed by Thomas. Uh, good evening. Glenn Stroud, Riverview Neighborhood. Uh, as you've heard from many residents, the park ranger program is very important to all users of, of our park system. It is important to have an authority figure on site to address and resolve problems as they occur. My immediate concern is the process to involve the residents in the decision-making process. The Santa Ana Charter, as amended at by the February 2008 election, Section 908, Powers and Duties of the Board of Recreation and Parks, Item A, states that the board consider all matters regarding programs, usages, or services of the Department of Recreation and Parks other than administrative matters. The minutes of the November 18, 2004 of the Board of Recreation and Parks show that staff informed the board members of this proposed change. There was one, one board member comment. Staff closed the discussion by informing the board that the Prey Council Committee was informed at a public meeting on October 27, 2014, regarding the upcoming, not recommended, upcoming changes. Based on the minutes, board members were to assume that changes were approved by the Prey Committee and it was only a formality for Council to approve. I went online to view the Prey Committee minutes of October 27, but the only minutes available are January 27, 2014. The staff report concludes, the staff report that you all received on this issue, by stating that staff will make sure that feedback from the community is taken into consideration as the development efforts of option A takes place. There has been no comment, no opinion, no recommendation from the Board of Recreation and Parks that you all appointed. How are we to believe that staff will involve residents when it appears that the staff has not included the Board of Recreation and Parks in the decision-making process? Thank you. We have our final uh, speaker, Thomas Anthony Gordon. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we've heard from residents tonight. We've heard from law enforcement professionals tonight. We've heard from city employees. 
we've heard from Parks and Rec's employees, um, there is no mistaking, it's unanimous. Everybody wants option C. The public wants it, the employees want it, the park rangers want it, the children want it. It's the option that makes most sense for the safety of our residents and our children in our parks. You've, if anybody has checked their emails recently, I'm sure you've seen the emails I've been sending in about the obscene amount of graffiti that's been covering at least one of our parks recently. And by obscene, I mean obscene. Uh, it's been giant penises drawn into our parks. It's been gang riding on our parks. Uh, we've had a drinking fountain stolen. We've had drinking fountains uh, tampered with, lights busted out, wiring stolen. It, it, the parks are being abused and neglected. Um, and as somebody with a walkie-talkie that's 18 years old being completely untrained is just not the right professional to have there. I'm sorry, but there's more layers of protection to get into this council meeting in the building that we possess, our city hall, than there is for the children in our parks. You get wanted outside and you have armed people sitting here at a wall between us and you. We're the threat? I, I think not. I think we need to make sure that the children of this city, that we send a message to them that they matter and that their safety matters. And it's important that you all uh, recognize that and vote appropriately for option C. Um, if you choose to go in a different direction down the road, that's fine. But option C is the only option that sends the message that your safety matters. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I have no other speakers on item 65C. So I will now bring it to uh, council for a discussion and consideration. Mayor, Councilor I Martinez. Have a, I have a motion. I have no more to discuss. I have a motion on the table. So I'm not sure if there, there's any other discussion. Well, for Council colleagues. Member Benavides was not here at the last yeah, meeting. So I don't know if he wants any, any questions or thought or comment. I, I do have a question, uh, Mayor, for, for Council. And I apologize for missing this section of the meeting uh, last this, this part of the meeting last uh, two weeks ago, I was not feeling well and, and uh, uh, needed to, to depart the meeting. But question four uh, for staff. Uh, on item B, or option B, it says continue the existing armed park ranger program. My, my uh, understanding, presentation information I received from staff is that the reason that this, uh, that there needs to be a change, or that, that a change is being proposed by staff to council as a, res as a result of uh, CalPERS and, and, and the retirement, uh, what, what's allowed based on, on, on PERS. With B, uh, does it, uh, w w how, how would we potentially keep the park ranger program? How is it basically uh, different, B from C, keeping the park ranger program as it exists uh, without uh, uh, having to address new, new hires? Uh, you know what, yeah, if you can just explain the difference. Thank you, uh, Councilman Benavides, uh, Mayor, Member of the City Council. Option C uh, basically keeps the park ranger program. Uh, the di distinction there would be to uh, hire people uh, that are not uh, uh, annuitants from the city of Santa Ana. That's in violation of the law. City attorney can confirm that. Uh, most of these individuals have been there for seven and a half years. The law changed in 2012. They're the four remaining employees in the city of Santa Ana that uh, have not separated. Uh, and so that's one of the issues that you just discussed. However, uh, based on co uh, prior co uh, conversations and direction from council, looking at options, uh, one of the options under option C is to have uh, park rangers with uh, firearms, uh, with training, uh, retired uh, individuals from non-city of Santa Ana, Calpers and Newtons, like retired sheriffs for Los Angeles was one example. And they would uh, basically be hired. Uh, the existing park ranger is one of them that doesn't have a new intent issue, would remain. Uh, and then uh, those individuals would be uh, recruited for and hired under the auspices of the police department. Uh, but last, last comment uh, I have. Uh, it, it seems, it appears to me that the, the park rangers, again, the issue is presented to us not because of the the. the System uh, not working, or the or the the uh, there being something broken in the in the park ranger program, as much as it being a retiree uh, situation. When the park ambassador program was presented, however, it seemed like a, a way to be able to leverage and and increase the presence that we would have in parks. Uh, you know, having more individuals out there in the field, we we have we have very limited. Uh, 
San Ana Police Department, we have an even more limited uh, park ranger uh, uh, program as far as number of officers out there. Uh, however, from, from hearing uh, members of the community, uh, just see personal interaction and, and demonstrating that, or just recognizing that, that our city is unique perhaps from some of the, the more suburban uh, cities that may not have par uh, armed park ranger programs. For me, it seems that uh, a both end is actually a, a, a very positive a solution where we would potentially be able to have some park ambassadors out there to have a greater presence, uh, uh, but also keeping to a, to a certain degree the, uh, the park ranger program. I do have a concern with the, the February 18th, a lot of our, and part of what we've been seeing the city, the institutional knowledge uh, depleting, you know, as retirements over at different departments, people that have departed from, from the city, now we, we see this as a potential uh, situation within the park ranger program if, if they all or, or majority were to, to depart February 18th. So it seems to me that there is a demonstrated need to at least keep those uh, existing park rangers through this transition. Uh, I'm not sure what, what the, the recommendation was uh, or, or the proposal uh, or motion by, by Council Martinez, but it seems to me that, that a, a hybrid, if you will, uh, would, would seem, to be, uh, seem to be something that we should consider. But, but I know she's eager to, to make a motion, so I'll turn it back to the mayor so to go let ahead. me make the motion, Council Martinez, because I know we're not on the same page, so then you can go ahead and then rebut after. But let, let me go um, move forward, and this is the direction that I would like to give to our staff. And the reason why I'm going to be making um, you know, this motion is, one, I want to move forward to direct staff to support option B pending our staff to going to get a letter from the CalPERS board letting us know if they can stay on or off, so supporting the existing park ranger program per the municipal code and keeping them on board for the transition period as we move forward with option C to start the new recruitment process of new park ranger program with, the, with, with retired sheriffs and will be within the police department who will be in charge. I'm not going to make the decision to one, increase any park rangers at this moment in time because we have to follow a process and I will hope that as we have our budget calendar, the, um, we will have a discussion on this issue in March. So if we want to allocate more park rangers, we can do so in March. So that is my current position. And as for 55, um, I think it is 55C that Councilman Benavides mentioned in regards to the ambassador program, I too would place that on hold. And let's have that, this, this converse, that budget conversation in March since we're going to keep these park ranger uh, So let's board. make that a motion, see if there's a second, second and then we'll comment. take discussion. Is there a second? Second with comment. Com okay, second. go ahead. But comment, can I you want to go sure. next? Go ahead. Can I um, please ask Chief Rojas to come on up, please? Uh, Chief Rojas, I, I heard, uh, and, and I would like the city manager to also chime in here if you can. Um, I've heard some arguments that have come from speakers who have come forward. There's this misunderstanding, I think, with some folks, not everyone, but with some folks, that the ambassadors are actually replacing patrol. And so I wanted to ask you, what is it that our offices are going to do? Yeah, um, yeah, I heard those comments as well, and that's not my understanding of the program. Uh, our officers would be dedicated to public safety activities. They'd be doing the public safety portion of the park ranger duties. So you would have a 40-hour-a-week officer not in the office. He would be in the parks, dedicated patrolling the parks, and the other 60 hours a week would be filled with overtime officers, all post-certified, state-certified police officers. But would those officers be out there strictly for park enforcement? For, for park enforcement, correct. So under, so here's, here's the part that I think people aren't understanding. Under our current system with the park rangers, how many hours do they offer in a week? Are we, are we using our five park rangers for? I know Gerardo could probably speak to that a little bit more succinct, but I, I can tell you I did talk to one of his staff today, and she did inform me that uh, 
they basically select their hours in terms of availability. And what I plan to do is really look and analyze what the crime picture looks like in each park and staff to the needs of the city as opposed to the needs of an individual. So how many hours would you allocate, uh, Mr. Moet, for park rangers on a weekly basis? A maximum of 20, I mean, of 100 hours per week, 20 hours per week, per, and there are five of them when they're available. Okay. Did the, uh, so sometimes it was less so, than that. Sometimes it's less. Okay. And so, thank you, Mr. Martin. Mm -hmm. So what what I'm seeing here is what I'm seeing here is a staffing of officers strictly for the parks, and these are our officers from the city of Santa Ana who are going to work 60 hours. They're going to put in 60 hours of work, and on top of that, we also have another officer who's going to be out there providing another 40 hours. This, this is consistent time. So this is why I'm a little perplexed, because on face value, you really have more direct officers in our parks under this plan. On top of that, what you also have is the ambassadors. Now, let me clarify what the ambassadors do. It, right now, our park rangers are there to enforce, but they also answer calls that deal with, our lights turned off? Can we turn them back off? Uh, this person is, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I am AYSO, and these kids just started practicing in my field, and we have allocated that, that, alloc that field's allocated to us. A park ranger comes in, verifies the paperwork, and says, yeah, you're supposed to leave, right? Our ambassadors are there for that purpose. It's to manage the, the time slots in the park, to manage the lights, and so forth. I don't think they have a target on their back, no more than a coach who's coaching a team has a target on their back. I think there are people that service the city and work for the city, and on top you still have the park. So, so what I'm seeing is park rangers, I think everybody's getting caught up with the actual title of park ranger. What I'm looking at is enforcement, park safety enforcement on a consistent level. And by doing that, by allocating that, it provides for more patrol, and number two, it creates another layer of eyes and ears out there to also be visible in the parks. The reason why I have a problem with option B, and I would like my colleagues to hear this, is that with option B, we are basically telling the state that we are going to vote to break the law, knowing full well that CalPERS is not consistent with what we're doing and this is the reason why we did this I have sat here with people from uh, from other members of SEIU I have sat here with people from from the park rangers and it's not a personal item against park rangers park rangers do a great job they've done a great job under the scope that we've had them there in order for us to fall within the law the the letter of the law we have to make some adjustments but in making those adjustments we have asked staff to increase the patrols and to give another level of service. This is not regressing on service. This is not regressing on, on, on what we're doing. This is an increase. This is a more consistent increase. Now let me let you in on a little something else. Some people, including myself, uh, had said that we sometimes, our, our relationship with the park rangers are so close that we know them that we sometimes call on their cell phone for them to come out and, and respond, and they do from what the police chief later informed us is that's not the best practice for the city because we're not getting the true data of where our hotspots are, where we really need more park rangers to patrol, and where there's less of a need. Now, all the calls are going to go through our dispatch. We're going to get true numbers where we're able to really create a stronger plan for public safety. So I am not getting caught up in the park rangers. I love the park rangers. They're good people. One of them was my old coach from high school, who I've respected and I still call him coach. And it's hard for me to be on the other side. But as a council member, I'm also put in the responsibility of looking not just what's best for the community today, but what's best for the community down the road. And I just don't see how we can make the argument, as you just heard from our Parks and Rec Director, head out of the Moet, that he can allocate up to 100 hours when they're available, and a police chief saying that we are going to be consistent with 100 hours with police officers that are under his jurisdiction, which is where our public safety should be under. And 
it just makes it very difficult for me to, to hear all these other, other arguments. Some of these are a little bit of a slippery slope argumentation. I, I have to say this. I cannot vote to keep on uh, to, to violate state law, and I cannot vote to, uh, to go outside to people who are outside of the CalPERS. What that's going to do is shrink our pool of applicants to people from outside, from L.A., from Long Beach. And I just, I, I heard multiple times that one of the things that people like is that people that are working in our parks know the city of Santa Ana. So going to that other option where we're going to eliminate people that are in CalPERS goes against that argument. So you go against the argument by going that route. I've heard people say they don't want that. They prefer people that know our parks. Going for option B violates CalPERS. I've heard people say, and, and we can't go that route. So I see the only other alternative is to increase patrol, which is what we're doing. We're making it consistent with 100 hours with our officers that are trained under our police department. And on top of that, bring in ambassadors to the forefront that are more eyes and ears for the community. How is that going backwards? That's going forward. And that's why I end my comments. All right, new comment, uh, Councilor Vince Sarmiento, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And I, Mayor Pro Tem. I'm fine with Council Member. It's not a problem. I wanted to thank uh, Council Member Tina Hedo because he made some very compelling arguments, and I think they're important because we're looking at gap periods. We're looking at us already uh, maybe violating some state law. So, um, what I do want to begin with, though, is um, is thanking Park Ranger Ald Eldridge because he spent um, some time with me this past week talking about the, the uh, park ranger program and we're just um, talking about some of the issues that came before us and I think it's important. The reason why I'm supporting the motion on the floor is because I believe it pulls from all three options and I do think that um, uh, many of us struggle with this because we know that the program is something that's worked. Um, we know that it's something that um, has garnered good results. I hope we can evolve as a community, and I think we, we are. We're, the the community is much safer than it was when the program first started, so we know that the pro program has gotten us far. I hope that it continues to get us further and we're able to maybe at one point um, be, a, be a city that's just patrol patrolled by folks that... Um, that um, you know are unarmed and our residents and our neighbors and people who use the parks will respect that but we're not there yet and that's something that we need to consider so but I think we're getting there so um, one of the things that I do think is important though um, is somebody made a comment at the last meeting that if it's not broken let's not fix it but one thing that we also have to see if it's not broken and we realize we can improve on something we have to resolve that as well. So I think after speaking with um, uh, you know, our chief, hearing uh, from our chief at the last meeting, hearing from the director of uh, uh, Parks and Recs, and speaking with our city manager staff, I think that this motion is a sound one because it removes um, park rangers that are armed and are going to continue to be armed, that are going to continue to be trained, and that are going to need resources as they continue their function. We just need to have them in an appropriate department. And I think that that department is better suited in the police department rather than the Parks and Recs because there are resources there. There's capacity there. So I think that that's going to be the more, um, the more sound approach to take. I agree. I think if we can overlay this solution with an ambassador program at some point, I think it's not a bad idea. But I think the uh, Councilwoman Martinez is correct. We have to make sure that we have that allocation made in the budget. So um, with that, I will be supporting the motion. The only thing I think that was left out of that motion, even though it was comp comprehensive, is how we deal with the timing issue. And I'd hate for us to leave a gap period before we start looking outside, maybe looking to the sheriffs, but maybe city staff can help us with that. So, Mr. City Councilor Manager. Martinez, just before that, you made the motion. Can you just restate your motion, especially if you have a, a way of addressing this gap question? But as I understand it, you're basically saying to continue with the park ranger program, um, and then you want to combine it with option C, which is to expand it in, in the future. But was there more than that to your motion, please? Yes, Mayor. Um, and only supporting option B with getting a letter from CalPERS indicating if they can stay or not. And then if CalPERS says that they can stay, we will then have a 60-day transition period to train the new officers. What we don't want to have is a gap. And so what we need to do immediately when this motion moves forward, if it does, is 
to get that to go to CalPERS board, get the letter, move on as well with the recruitment of option C. But I think one more point of clarification. And they will the, be going to the police department. That was my last point, just to make sure that that, that component and that element is clear. So, Mr. City Manager. Yes. I'll make a substitute motion. All right, well. I, I will keep, no, no, I will, I will concur with what uh, Council Member Martinez stated about going to CalPERS to get a letter. <coughs> if they come back and say that it's okay for them to stay, then I concur with that particular portion of it. Uh, but if they say that it's they're not okay to stay, then I think we have to go with our professionals, which is our police chief, and go with option A. Um, if they dis if CalPERS tells us that they cannot go forward versus the C, because the C brings people from the outside in here. And All right, is there a second for the substitute motion? Uh, I, I'll second, uh, Councilmember. All Member right, any let's motion. hear from the city manager, and then we'll vote on the substitute. And if it fails, we'll go back to the original motion. Thank you, Mayor. I think it's very important that. Uh, we hear from the police chief on one issue related to the motion about post certification and then secondly um, I'm not sure we're going to get a letter uh, maybe the uh, city attorney can expand on that uh, and the letter may take a long time to get uh, or we may get one right away we may not get one so my concern is that if we're going to extend the time that we have a day certain at a minimum to come back to the council to give a report what I'm very, very worried about is that we rescind the letter. I've given and you 60 days, goes, Mr. Pardon? City Manager, 60 days. 60 days, great. Chief, you had a comment? Uh, I just want to make sure that the council understands that we called uh, Peace Officer Standards and Training for the State of California, and we gave them the name of all our current park rangers. None of them are state certified. And so what, as the police chief, if they're under my command, I do not want to jeopardize the integrity of our police department by having individuals carrying guns that aren't post certified. So I would want to take a pause and make sure that uh, that we train these folks and that they have post certification and at that time patrolling the parks would have to be left up to the to the police department but i do want you all to understand that they do not have current post certification while they're recognized as peace officers by the municipal code they're not recognized as peace officers by by the state of california because they don't have the continuous professional training that's required of police officers and the municipal code allows them to carry firearms I, I, I don't know about the firearm, but it, it recognizes them as being able to do enforcement on behalf of the city of Santa Ana. So the chief's recommendation, chief, if, if, you're, if, if I'm stating, restating what you said correctly, you would say during that gap period while we are out recruiting for uh, other park rangers, your department would surveil and monitor the parks in the interim? It, it, absolutely, we would have to. I, I cannot let the, the current park rangers work under my command without being post certified so if they were if that were to be extended i would want them to get up to speed in terms of post certification question Mayor, i just have a quick question they've been on the job still to this day and why are you just raising this question now chief rojas i i actually provided it in, in memos previously and uh, i have several emails and that's that's been an issue that was brought up from the yeah. word go yeah but they have been post certified in the past and because we've had this problem this issue hasn't come up just this year i brought this issue up over two years ago when we started this process and they were post certified but because we wanted to move forward and move on when we started realizing we had this cal purse issue and they were not the only employees violating this specific law i specifically time and time again i went to our city attorney i went to our former city manager our interim city manager indicating there were, there were various people, police officers, park rangers, people in public works, all in violation of this law. And so now that we're discussing this particular issue with the park rangers program and that they're not post certified, it's for the reasons that the city wanted to ri get rid of them without the city council and the community really having input that's why we're here today but they're currently still our park rangers and so if that's going to be a problem of uh, chief rojas then i'm going to make an amendment that they stay where they currently are at until we do this transition period and hire the, these folks and then we move forward and then they go to your police department then they'll have the certification thank you i second that all right but but wait a minute uh, before you do that let me 
see if we have a vote on the substitute motion that's on the floor. If that fails, then we'll go back to the original motion. You can amend it. Made a motion. But that would be the third motion. Let me vote on the we're, second we're, we're one. Limited at three, limited at two. Yeah, okay. yeah, we are. So, so let's on the substitute no. motion. Uh, we have motion by uh, Councilmember Dinahedo, second by and, uh, Councilmember Mesqua. Those in favor on the substitute motion, please say aye. 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 Those against, no. Aye. So it fails five to two. Now let's go back to the original motion. Um, Councilmember Martinez. I just want to make sure that, um, 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 that you, you guys are in favor of that. I respect Chief Rojas and his position and wanting to make sure that he has officers that are post-certified, and I get it, but I'm wanting to make sure that we continue this so that we have a transition period with trained park rangers. So I'm making a friendly amendment to, at to your this own moment, motion. To, to my original motion at this moment in time because of what Chief Rojas just stated to and within this transition period while we go get this letter the 60-day cap that we've provided that they stay within the parks and recreation department as we do the recruitment when we do the recruitment they will then go to the police department I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make go ahead. a comment um, I'm gonna I'm gonna vote no and and, um, and I'm gonna shut up uh, because I, I think I'm gonna be on the losing end of this but I just I think that it is it is for me very difficult to sit up here as a policymaker who's not a police officer who hasn't been trained to go to be a police officer to take the uh, not take the recommendation of, of our police chief and so I'm just gonna vote no you know uh, I'm the maker of the second on this on, on the motion I wish that amendment wouldn't have come in because it really did distort things for me I think that one of the concerns that I have was this, was the one that the chief just mentioned is having people out there putting them in danger and we're not talking about the public. We're putting the, the, the employees that we're hiring in danger. So um, I can be supportive of the motion with the exception of the amendment just because I think that if we're talking about a gap period where we know we're going to be hiring and, you know, uh, uh, option C that's incorporated into your motion, council member, I think that addresses the issue. It's a timing issue. We just have to do this. And you're right. I wish we would have started this clock before and the recruitment would have began and we would have had people ready to go and post-certified. But that's just not the case. So I think the interim solution, rather than having employees in there that are maybe you know, going to endanger themselves and, and, and put us into, into jeopardy and expose us, I think the best thing to do would have been to stay with the police as a gap period, as, a, as a, just a temporary gap solution to what, uh, what we have as a timing issue. He just said, Chief, are you willing to accept that to have your officers come in and, and yeah. fill that void in the uh, interim? Uh, I, I have it worked out to whichever way you vote. I plan on you providing public work. safety right. service in the parks. All right. Thank you. So with that, uh, may we've discussed enough. Uh, yeah. Restate your motion. I mean, it's the same one. Go ahead. The motion is to direct staff to move forward with option B, the existing park ranger program per the municipal code, pending a letter from CalPERS and having a 60-day cap transition period and moving forward with option C to start the recruitment of new park rangers and they will eventually be with the police department. And I'll second. But, but it'll still be a park ranger program. Within. Yes. It'll be up, it'll, so the committee will retain the park ranger yeah. program. Yeah. That's a part of the motion, correct? All right. <laughs> With that, j j just, just a brief comment. Go ahead. Uh, to, to your point, Mayor, uh, and uh, I think that overall law enforcement does make sense to be under police department, but some type of, because it is patrolling the parks, that there ought to be some type of link to, to uh, the Department of, of Parks and Recreation. So uh, what we have very intelligent staff that can work out and figure out what that link, how that link is, is, should work out, but there should be a, a, a link there where there is direct communication with staff. And, and, and I want the Parks and Recs Department and also the you know, Parks and Recreation Commission uh, and the community to have input on that to make sure that it remains a program that the community feels is there and that's dedicated to the parks uh, uh, period. I yes. have a quick question, just so that I know. How long does it take to get post-certification, uh, Chief Rojas? 
approximately. The advantage that we have with the retirees is that they do have a post certificate. So if they have a break in service, there's a background investigation that we have to do. Uh, they do have to have 24 continuous professional uh, training hours within a two year period. I mean, we can get them the training relatively quick. They have to have that post certification. The most difficult part is gonna be the recruitment and the background side of it, which could take upwards of six months to nine months. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Moreno. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll keep my uh, comments brief as it looks like we're moving in the direction I'd like to move into. Uh, I think the, the program itself is, is, is extremely helpful to the community. I think it's imperative that we have it. We've heard from the community that they're screaming for it. So I completely uh, support that I have from the beginning. Uh, I will support this. My preference would have been to keep it at, at, at the Parks and Rec because if I was in charge of something... If I was in charge of something, I would, make, I would want to make sure that I had control over the safety. Th that, to me, is just management. And, and you need to be able to utilize whatever resources you have to take care of your department for whatever issues that, that come arise. Uh, and having to say so, I will support the, the motion that we do going forward because I do believe that at the end of the day, we need this program. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for that uh, position. So with that, those in favor, please say aye. 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 No. Those no. opposed? No. No. We have two no's. Did you get that? Um, okay. So with that, we are going to continue on to the next item. Now, on 55A, that, in essence, is just on hold for a period of time, correct? Do you need, do you need a motion on that? We have, a, yeah. we have a, a, a question on that, Mayor, if we could. Okay. Could, could Ed Raya come up and explain the difference there? Yes. 55A contained a request for four positions, one of which was the park ambassadors. We'd like council to move forward on the other three positions. There are reclassifications, retitles, one's a reassignment of a bargaining. I group. would entertain such a motion. So moved. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed, motion carries unanimously. Uh, with that, uh, we're now going to go on to item 75A. This is time and place for a public hearing to consider authorizing condemnation of real property at 1501 North Bristol Street. And um, I have a speaker on that. Um, actually, Madam Clerk, do we have any written communications? No, we have not. I don't, I'm not sure I have any speaker on that. I don't. I don't. I, and let me now open it up to the public on this um, uh, proposed condemnation. 1501 North Bristol Street. Anybody to speak on that? Seeing no one, let me close the public hearing, bring it back to City Council for uh, consideration. I'd entertain a motion. Motion so to approve. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries unanimously. Item um, 85A, I have a speaker. Uh, Irma Haudegui, please. Hello, good evening, um, Honorable uh, Council Members, Mayor Pulido. I want to thank first and foremost um, Mayor Pulido and Michelle for supporting this item in the agenda. Uh, many of you are very familiar with our neighborhood uh, um, Christmas parade. And as president of the Wilshire Square Neighborhood Association and the boards and residents, we heartily support, uh, support the creation of a structure that can offset some of the costs, like security and things of that nature, to help uh, continue our community events, such as our annual Christmas parade, which, by the way, it's about 20 years old. And I think, Miguel, you were in the first one with, your, with Miguelito. Our parade creates and fosters a great sense of community and brings joy to our children throughout the whole neighborhood and the surrounding neighbors. This can also support uh, other activities and events to other neighborhoods. So that way we can uh, promote goodwill and partnerships with the city across Santa Ana for a higher quality of life. That should be the hallmark of our city. We've been talking about quality of life. When you have positive events like this, whether it's a parade, and you can offset some of the costs that have to be reasonable, um, not 
food or things like that, but security and things of that nature, then it can prom- be cre- we can be creative and we can be innovative. So we can be a city with a heart that can actually support neighborhood associations to create uh, their well-being and, and fostering the, um, a high quality of life throughout the neighborhoods and wonderful events. So thank you uh, to consider a structure. Have a, have a good evening. Thank you. Any other speaker on that? See no one. Let me bring it back to council and maybe I can begin, but I'd like uh, comment uh, from others as well, please. Uh, I brought this um, uh, before us because I think we need to have a policy. I know there's, uh, I think, a council committee looking at this right now uh, that would consider, you know, where and how we choose to uh, participate uh, as a city in supporting community events. Um, in this case, I think we're talking about $1,000. It's not a huge number, but it is to that neighborhood association uh, that had a wonderful event. And we assessed some fees, I think, through the police department, and that's what's under debate. So um, what I would like to see is that we, uh, in essence, hold off on that until we have a, a policy. And in the future, I, in other words, I think they owe $1,000 right now per the uh, money that was assessed, that they would not pay that $1,000 until we come up with a policy from our committee as to how we're going to uh, approach these type of events. I think, Cal- already, I think maybe yes. they've already paid it. Yeah, it's already been paid. You paid? I thought you didn't pay. You paid it personally, Irma? Please, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Let me say Then I, why, I, why did I bring it up? <laughs> Go ahead. Mayor, the reason why we, we uh, why I supported you on this 85A, I've been working with staff for over a year in trying to create a, a, a policy, not only for city council, but staff on community events and how we do in kind. Uh, we don't have really a set line item in our, our, in our budget to, 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 to do these in kinds over the, the previous years, in particular, maybe a year or so ago, our city staff has um, done over $80,000 in in kind through various departments. The city council has asked various times to help support neighborhoods and community events, and we've never been given that opportunity. And so I just think that um, as we move forward, and I support our staff providing in kind for various events to the community when there is a need. But as well, I think it's important for the city council to have that opportunity as well when organizations or neighborhoods like Wilshire Square wanting to have parades or wanting to have block parties. We used to support those things. It was done in a different fashion, but now we need to have structure. We need to have a policy that this city council needs to support. And so I've, as, as we move forward with our budget process and uh, things will be coming before us in March, I want to put this in motion and ask our direct our city manager to start working on providing us options of how this city council can participate whether you decide and provide us various options with our city attorney giving the city council a certain amount each council member to could go into I don't think we need to send this to, to the committee um, staff's been working for this over a year and I can um, do, um, ask miss our city attorney um, this started with Debbie Carita when she was here and Kevin O'Rourke so it's been quite a while that I've been working on this issue and so um, miss city madam attorney um, has pu- already has already worked with Mark Lawrence on certain policies that were supposed to come before us for us to review. And so that work has been done. And, and I think they've, I haven't seen the information, but Madam City Attorney, can you just please brief us very quickly on the work that has been done over this issue and, and wanting to set a policy for the City Council? The issue of establishing a policy for in-kind contributions or contributions for a nonprofit um, came up about over a, little, over a year ago. Um, we did have a meeting amongst all members from different departments who were affected by this. Um, I prepared uh, some draft policies just for discussion purposes, and we were working with Debbie Carita upon her departure. That didn't get picked up necessarily, but we do have it now, and today I provided city manager staff with copies of those draft policies and would expect that we'd have some ongoing discussions um, for the future. And I don't know what the city manager's plans are, but that's, that's what we've done to date. 
So this is a policy decision, and that's why this is before us, to ask and direct our city uh, manager with the information that has been provided within the homework that has been done to come back to this city council with some options so that we can go ahead and, and participate within this in-kind policy that internally has been happening for various years, but the city council has not been able to participate. All right. Let's take additional comment. Uh, council member... Uh, uh, you know, first mayor pro tem and then the former mayor pro tem, or you want to go the other way around, Sal? We can go this way. All right, you got it. You're next. Then, you know, um, the uh, I, I feel like uh, in, in you know in, in task groups you have the the task leader who leads the group. You have the the uh, tension reliever, which likes to joke around to relieve tension. And one of the things that you that is essential is the central negative. Though he's he or she is not the most he is not he or she is not the most popular person in the group, but it it, it creates the elimination of group. <laughs> Which think. one is Sal? I'm the central negative tonight. <laughs> so uh, the reason I'm going to be a central negative tonight is because one of the things that as we go forward, we start thinking about the people in this body, and I respect the people on this body. I think the people on this body are have a high level of ethics, they care about the city. But to put the city council in a position where we get to vote on where we're going to put money into city uh, groups or city organizations is a very, very dangerous thing. It could become highly politicized. Corruption can come out of it, where people are cutting special deals with different neighborhoods, and then other neighborhoods find out about that deal, and then they start to criticize us. That's why I want us to be very, very careful that we don't just start to choose, pick and choose who we give breaks to. If I think this is something that should have been discussed in our strategic plan, uh, because again, it's not about the people on this council, it's what happens when the majority of this council is no longer here. And that's my concern, is the precedent that we set as we go forward with something like All right, this. Mayor Pro Tem, then I'll go to my left and I'll come back for second comments. Thank Please. you, Mr. Mayor, and I also wanted to um, Thank Council Member uh, Tina Hiddle for always raising concerns that are very legitimate. I think they're persuasive because, uh, look, anytime individuals, individual council members make unilateral allocations without any oversight, they'll be questioned. I know that that's just the nature of the, um, of the policy. But I do think that there's precedent for this as well. I know the city of Anaheim has their council members have certain amounts of funds that are allocated to them and they use their discretion and their good judgment to support community events, com support nonprofits. And I think we have so many worthy nonprofits in the, in the community that sometimes um, maybe, you know, now the mayor is very supportive of, um, of the Wilshire Square uh, neighborhood parade. I remember a couple of years back, and I think, Chief, maybe you remember this when you were the city manager temporarily for us, there was a health fair that was being hosted um, by the Mexican consulate and another nonprofit, I believe it was um, Latino Health Access. They wanted fees waived because the, the fees for their health fair to provide information about obesity, about diabetes, free information to the public, it was a $500 fee that they had to pay. We, I asked for a, a co-sponsorship by the city so we could relieve them and give them a, some relief for about $250. Our policy didn't allow for it. So what I did, what was simpler is I think what you did, Edom, I just cut a check from my, from my office and just went ahead and, and allowed them to go forward. But it shouldn't be that way. For, for, for a health fair to be prevented from going forward because of a $250 gap just doesn't seem right. So I think that... Um, we, I think with the right oversight and the right disclosure, if funds are made available for discretion by each council member, um, look, we, we're, we have to disclose our conversations. We have to disclose our meetings, what we do uh, all month long. So I think this will be one more layer of disclosure that I think anybody can be responsible for. So I would suggest that we do, Mr. City Manager, give you direction to maybe make an allocation in the budget for some fixed finite amount of funding for support for these community events um, and nonprofits to be left to the discretion of each council member. And, you know, what that number is, what that looks like, um, you know, we can talk about that and maybe some options can be uh, prepared for the city council. Thank you. All right, let me continue. Who wants to comment additionally? Councilman Romesqua? Well, I think until we come back with options, I, I, I'd be wise to wait. Well, we're not doing anything tonight, <laughs> so I don't know what we're waiting for, but Councilman Marina. Sure, absolutely. You know, um, one of the unique things of Santa Ana, 
and, and I will special to is that we have a neighborhood association. Not a homeowners association where you have to pay fees. This is a neighborhood association. This is a collective body of residents, of neighbors coming together for a greater good. Whatever that good happens to be, whether they're fighting some injustice that's taking place, whether they're beautifying their neighborhood, or they're just coming out for social so that when they, they can watch out for each other when some bad things happen in the community. I come from the neighborhood association. I'm the past founder of my neighborhood association, uh, vice chair of Comlink. And so I definitely believe in, in our neighborhood associations. And I think there's a difference between neighborhood associations and nonprofits. And I come from the nonprofit world as well. But I still think that the neighborhood associations, associations are completely different. My recommendation would be to include some type of mini grant that doesn't carry over. It's a, a, a use it or lose it at whatever fee, at whatever level we, we come up with, whether it be 500 or thousand dollars, just enough to uh, help bridge that particular gap with the caveat that they have to partner up with the school or PTA. Our community needs to build a, a unity. We need to learn how to work together. And too often, we look at the district as the, a different entity. We look at the neighborhood associations and the PTAs as different entities, and they're not. They're all Santa Ana residents. And we need to figure out ways to bridge that particular gap. I think that I would love to, do, uh, I'm sorry, I direct staff to include this in one of their uh, recommendations as their options, whether it be option A or option Z, but someplace with included in that. I think this uh, really lends itself to uh, the community being creative, definitely takes the hands out of the, neighbor, uh, out of the elected here and picking and choosing who we might and who we may not. This is a good foundation for our residents to stand up, take ownership of their own city, and partner up with other residents. That would be my recommendation. Thank you, uh, Councilman David Benavides, please. Thank you, Mayor. I think we've had a lot of very good discussion, very healthy discussion. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman uh, Tinajero, for the small group communications lesson. Took me, give me flashbacks, man, to college. I think I passed that class. I couldn't remember. I was trying to remember. Uh, but uh, uh, I do agree that the, that our neighborhood associations are very unique. I think that's one of the things that sets the city of Santa Ana apart from from most other cities. Uh, making sure that we support the neighborhood associations and and. Uh, uh, extend some type of of, uh, of even monetary support. I think is is uh, it would send a, a strong message, but also uh, provide some resources. There there are some neighbor associations that uh, might not have that that angel donor that would contribute out of their own pocket or, or would have the capacity to do that. So I would agree that having uh, some type of mechanism there and and that that uh, encouraging that relationship with a local school, local PTA, another community group would be a, a positive thing as well. Uh, with regard to this idea of, of some type of, of uh, discretionary fund line item or some, some sort of mechanism by which council uh, in our own respective districts or, or wherever we might, might see a, a need, we might be able to direct uh, a, a small portion of funds. I think it, it makes sense, especially for a city uh, of our size, one of the, the 10th, 11th largest city in, in, in the state. Uh, I, I've talked to colleagues in other cities. Uh, I think we're one of the few. That, that don't have some type of, uh, that basically we have a, a, a zero uh, fund allotted uh, for any of us to give any, any type of, of discretion. We've, we've actually brought this up. Uh, I think it's even beyond a year, two years. It, it's something that I know I've had discussions, a number of us have had discussions with previous uh, uh, city management, and discussion has been had, and that's where it, it's only gone as, so far as a discussion. One of the, the, the parts of the discussion is also, was also, I remember some time back, is having some type of, of uh, uh, support, staff support to, to, to council. Uh, it ended up uh, uh, being kind of, kind of morphing a bit, so we do have additional support uh, to, to city manager's office, and those folks do end up uh, uh, supporting council. But it, it was different. It was from what the initial intent and what the initial direction and, 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 uh, of, of council was. But, you know, it's, it's, it's working, but it, it's something that, uh, I, I do hope that this go around we do end up having uh, something that uh, a response and solution to uh, being able to have a, a mechanism by which council can, can directly uh, extend some, some support to a lot of great community uh, groups, events, uh, projects out there. Uh, so I, 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 I don't know if we have... Was there an actual motion? Yeah, on the I don't think a motion is we're necessary. We have the direct step. Um, I, I think we, we just are giving our, our opinion publicly, and then no, it'll Mayor. come back. Uh, final quick I, comment, I just want to say one quick thing. Um, I, I don't know if I want that job of 
trying to figure out who I'm going to give money to because I can see people pulling me in all directions and, you know, just why are you giving money to this neighborhood association and why aren't you giving money to this neighborhood association? I think we need to be really cautious with that. Well, and when just we get elected, we have to make tough Mayor, decisions. Mayor, just very but quickly, so I do want direction. I do want to vote from this council. I'm not saying any specific. What I'm saying to this, to, to give direction to our city manager, he's made it very clear he wants direction, and I want to give him clear direction. And we're do we gonna, need four or we're five gonna votes? Vote. We're going to vote on this. Do you, is you, are you okay with four or five votes? Four, four votes will do it. okay with four votes. All right. I want to give him direction to one... To look at the information, you know, from our city attorney that, that, that has been provided and then also look at what other cities are doing in the surrounding county and then provide us with some options. So I, I, I would move a, 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 a step further yes. and yes. say that as he comes up with these options that we possibly talk about some dollar amount, I don't know if it's, you know, yeah, 5000 well, or 10000 something specific, with, within those, maybe 10 is a good number, within and that those, that number then go into the budget, so when we adopt the budget, it's there. Mayor, within those options, there has to be a cost analysis, so with those options, he will provide So I'll second, I'll second that motion. And that will come before us before March when we start. All right, we have a second and March, a third. When we start the, is the that discussion. Is that clear enough? Let me uh, make sure that I understand that you want me to come back with options, both across the board to neighborhood associations, without having people pick the ones yes, you like the most. Just various options. Without the most, you would also like to have a budget uh, allocation based on uh, best practices for similar size cities, and uh, I can do that. All right. With that, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries unanimously. Six zero. You're against it? I voted no. Five one. There was one no. Actually, I was going to be a no also. You're a no as well? Are you, were you or are you a yes? I'm a no. I'm a no. I thought we were going to make no decisions. You're a no. Okay. Right, we're giving them direction, but if you don't want to give direction, that's okay. Uh, with that, um, let's go on, and we're going to go to the Housing Authority meeting. I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Those in favor, please say. Is there a second? Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye those opposed, motion carries. Now we're going to go to public uh, comment. Uh, Carlos Nava, followed by Maria Villalobos, followed by Rory Smith. No, those were the ones you voted. All right, those were earlier, those were earlier. Do you have anybody else, Madam Clerk? All right, right here maybe then. Juan Arcadia, I believe it is. Followed by Michael Kubuziki, I believe. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening, everyone. I have a family-owned business. And two years ago, a FAMSA store closed in the area, and it's since been running illegally as a party rental salon on weekends, primarily Friday and Saturday night. I've called code enforcement. They've sent me to the city attorney's office. City attorney sent me back to code enforcement, and then they give me somebody else's number. Eventually, I end up talking to the same people over and over again. Again, I made my first complaint about a year and a half ago. I've been looped around for the last nine months. Apparently, no one knows who can actually shut them down. Um, in my business, if health inspection shows up and there's something wrong, they'll shut me down that same day. So I have an issue that a business that doesn't have any license to do what they're doing is getting away free with it and being so arrogant with it for two years. They put cones in public parking because they don't have the, the adequate parking spaces for their business that they're running. They take up the public parking, they affect the community, the community and they park in other business parking lots. So I, I'm here to see what we can do here to put an end to this. Because what stops people from doing illegal businesses if our city for two years has been unable to take care of this. Can you just give us your your address or something so we can figure out what ward it is? Okay, um, my business address is 500 South Main Street. 
the address of the store, or the what was the FAMSA store, is 505 South Main Street. So well, they're both right next to each other. It's right across the street. I think that's my ward, so I'll help you out. And Jorge, can you get all his information that's coordinated an appointment, Mr. City Manager, if that's okay? Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for coming Thank down. Michael, are you here? And then after Michael, Sus, uh, Susan Susana Sandoval, and then Debbie McEwen. And then after that, Steve McGuigan for the third time. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, uh, Honorable Council, Michael Klubnikin. Uh, you did a great job of uh, uh, commending our black leaders' well-deserved bows, but I've got a little bone to pick. Where's, where's my digital countdown clock? guess it's on back order, but I'll deal with this when I see the red light, I stop. You'll see the yellow light first. Please okay. keep going, Michael. Um, and again, I come in. You had a whole bunch of park uh, of people come up here, and you didn't cut them off or let them all speak. So. Uh, I got some bad news to tell you, though. What happens across the street at the pond at the Board of Supervisors affects everybody here. You know, we're all part of the same body. And I'm, I'm telling you, there's uh, bad news. And they just uh, renewed a lease with the Social Services Department. They're busting out of their britches. They're so big now, 4,200 strong. And even today, uh, they just uh, had a budget report, second quarter report. It added another... 114 positions. Um, Ely is up here because of a social worker. I'm up here because of a social worker came into my home. Uh, I'd like to do a little public service announcement for everybody here that if <clears throat> a caseworker comes knocking on your door, you don't let them in your home unless they have a court order, consent, or some kind of exigent circumstances. Don't let them intimidate you through coercion or extortion or if they come back with tenfold office or don't open the door because if they do, that's over. It's just like earlier this morning, the Board of Supervisors, a Council of Aging. They now have a program that they want to give the DA, social services, county council, public defender, a little more power to say, gee, who's going to, you know, mentally capacitate and we got a program for the seniors. Uh, this is a slippery slope. When they come into your life, you don't get them out. Uh, Elia, I'll give you an example. The, you know, he's been coming up here trying to sh share his case. The latest deal with Elia and his soap operas, really, is the public defender dragged him into a court last week, tried to be a conservator. They had a conservator saying that he's incompetent to be a conservator. The public defender who's defending his son. Uh, I was in the court here, and when the public defender was at the writ of habeas corpus, didn't even disclose exculpatory information like 10 blanking trips to the ER. Didn't cross-examine the witness. Didn't provide any exhibits. Uh, no, you don't want your hands in the p hands of a public defender, county council, the district, no. Uh, families got to take care of their own. We need to stop this overreaching of this, these government. Not you, but I'm telling you, over there, they're out of control. The, bo you know, but the new budget, 90 positions. No one gets a new position but social services. You go around the, the city here, empty parking lots, business out of business, but social services, wall-to-wall -wall cars. I see the Su Susanna, please. Susan Sandoval, followed by Debbie McEwen. Steve McGuigan for the third time, then Aya Dalgeen. Okay, a very good evening. Um, we have participated in the Commission 10 homelessness meetings and continue to be actively engaged in the community. At the Commission meeting last Friday, very important decisions and new strategies were agreed upon to move into action items. What is clear from the Normandy experience experience is that an engaged Santa Ana community has had a positive impact in helping the county move forward. Karen Roper stated that many lessons were learned from Santa Ana and Fullerton. Key among them is that the community must be engaged and involved in the process. Community concerns need to be addressed, input from community are crucial, and now the county and cities need to move forward. During the past several months, we have investigated an array of best practices 
practice models and services across the country being employed to effectively tackle homelessness. Our research has helped us learn that the scattered site housing model provides permanent housing and an integrated set of related services moving away from the 200 bed emergency shelter model. From our work, we have come to the conclusion that the work done by the Illumination Foundation demonstrates the most effective implementation of the scattered site housing model here in Orange County. The Illumination Foundation provides housing, medical care, workforce preparation, and children's programs. Their accomplishments and track record are very impressive. 4,648 clients have received housing and services. 1,820 clients have been placed in permanent housing. 8,718 clients provided medical care. 1,181 clients provided with workforce counseling. Very impressive, 1,211 children who received enrichment services, tutoring, developmental screenings, and mental health services. 97% of Illumination kids received a medical checkup in the last year. Since 2010, the recuperative care program has reduced the cost of serving the homeless by $11.8 million for LA and OC hospitals. Within the last six months, Illumination Foundation has successfully housed six medically vulnerable, chronically homeless individuals who have been living in Civic Center. The Illumination Foundation integrated approach works. This organization has a proven track record for successfully tackling the complexities of associated with homelessness. We encourage Santa Ana and other OC municipalities to seriously look at the results of the Illumination Foundation approach and to consider its utility for efforts here in Santa Ana and throughout OC to address this important issue. We urge the City Council to visit the Illumination Foundation Multi-Service Center at 1215 North Ross Street. This work is very impressive. The Illumination Foundation is establishing roots at the Ross Street House and will continue their efforts to increase the number of people currently residing at the Civic Center to the ranks of those that they successfully shelter and inspire. Thank it you. really is so impressive. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Uh, Debbie, followed by Aya. Good evening. I'd like to start with a thank you uh, with the city manager and public works. They replaced a tree on North Bush, which is long absent, and it was uh, definitely needed in that spot, so thank you for that. Um, then I, uh, two thoughts. I've been trying to deal uh, through the system uh, of parks uh, for French Park itself. You know, it's like 50 by 100 foot triangle park. It's teeny weeny. And um, a year ago when we had 50% of the grass was trampled down from overuse, I started asking for help at that time. Here we are at least a year later and now we're at about 80% dirt, just dirt in this little tiny park. I spoke with Ron Ono uh, 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 just a few weeks ago, um, uh, begging for, for help. It's grass seed before the rain, some yellow tape. Let's take care of it before we're 100% dirt. So I, I would really, I need some help from somebody in that because I'm not getting any, uh, anything from that end. And, and lastly, this isn't a new thing, but as I was driving through the city, usually I'm just to and from work, same path, rarely do I venture around. But last week, that was a little bit different. It was, I was out on the weekend, and I was sort of all over town. There were so many vendors, Ill, illegal vendors, on the sidewalks, on the streets, in the parkways. Everything from kitty chairs to cut-up fruit to uh, uh, flowers, all unlicensed, unregulated, untaxed. And, and you know, we, we talk endlessly about our bottom line and how we need to keep generating and how financially healthy we need to be. And, and, I, and I was thinking about that sort of trickle-down situation. The brick-and-mortar building, the, the, the brick-and-mortar uh, folks were a little bit upset because the, say, the truck vendors, they don't have to pay that property tax. They don't have to pay that big nut because they just have a small truck and they can do their own thing. That's like the next layer. And now even below that we have this massive layer of people who are from somewhere else with a wooden push cart set up on a public sidewalk and vending all day long with complete 
immunity from any sort of problem. Uh, the one that really comes to mind, because I pass twice a day every day, is uh, Grand and 17th. There used to be a massive ficus tree on that corner, and the illegal flower vendor sort of hid behind it. And I thought, okay, not everybody's paying attention. Well, they cut that tree down last year, and and it. So the other there, this illegal vendor has afforded no uh, uh, sun protection. So they have this 10-foot market umbrella right there. It's like, isn't anyone paying attention? And this is about 50 yards from the villa's flower shop. They have a building. They pay all of the fees uh, around that. So we, we just need to get a handle on that. Thank you. Thank you. Aya. And then Steve. Okay, Steve. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Pulido and members of Santa Ana City Council. My name is Ilya Ceglin. Democracy must be something more than two wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for dinner. James Bullard. <clears throat> I am part of culture that is an unforgivable transgression to tell about anybody unfavorable word, especially accusation. A person or organization in illegal activity. However, I am obligated to tell truth to save health and life of the communities. First of all, I want to save health and life of my innocent son. It is my personal uh, observation there is a big time illegal activity by Orange County Regional Center. Orange County Regional Center have staff with incompetent employee, employees and receiving around $400 million for disabled. I am confident if I would have opportunities, I would like you people chosen by communities to show what money to who going. They are not going to disable it. This money going to people who do, this money public don't belong to them. I asking for opportunity. I asking few times for attorney. Uh, I promise attorney I never did not get any attorney and I cannot afford attorney. It's I need People, listen what I tell you. I have, a, uh, I have a proof. I have a proof what they do with disabled. I can prove what they do with my son. You could not believe it. Social services, they say, oh, they, we, we trust them. They know what they do. It's not true. Public defender covers them up. I don't know how they connected between each other, but they cover each other. They stealing money who belong to disabled. And whatever has happened, they cover up. They have attorney, they have army of attorney, they threaten people. People, a lot of people cannot talk about that. Thank Ilya. you for your attention. Thank you, Ilya. And uh, Steve McGuigan, your last. Uh, Ilya, before you leave, I, I uh, forwarded some information to our city attorney. So before you leave, please uh, speak with her. I gave her the contact information at an agency called Clients' Rights Advocate. There's an advocate there, an attorney free of charge that will help you research what's going on at the at the Orange County Regional Center. That's what they do. It's the local office. So her name is Jacqueline Miller. She's a, she's an attorney. So uh, our city attorney will go ahead and give you that information. Thank you. I appreciate it. I already talked to her. She did not want to work with me. But you know maybe what? now she will work. Maybe she will now. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Steve McGuigan. All right. I'll try to make this quick. Thank you guys for hanging in there. I know it isn't easy sometime, and thank you for the negativity because it often does create dialogue that we would not be having otherwise. 
So anyways, we need to talk for a couple minutes about Centennial Park. Um, as we know, the college is over there taking up considerable space. There's actually close to six or seven acres that could be freed up and turned back into park space if the college would vacate and move to another facility. The classes they have there are not specialized. They could be held anywhere in the city. And there were other locations that were available. The register building would have been a fantastic location for the college. And that's an opportunity that came and went. They didn't jump while the iron was hot, and that, that opportunity has passed them by. The college right now has some money set aside because they've done some, well, they're, they're getting bonds. They're getting money from us. And it's incumbent on you because they have done an incompetent job of planning for the long-term future. It's incumbent upon you to make sure that you're guiding them and letting them know where these opportunities are and that you are being good stewards of the property that does actually belong to the residents of Santa Ana. There's a handful of people, relatively, that will actually use the college facility over the course of time compared to the number of people that need parks in Santa Ana on a regular basis. If that property could be returned to Parkland at some point in the future, that would be a magnificent thing. And I would hope that you all believe that your decisions, the things that you say and do up here, will last the, te the test of time. 35 plus years ago, a council made a decision and the college agreed to it. This is what's important. The college agreed that they would only be there for so long and then they would go. They would go quietly. They wouldn't fight. They would give that land back to the residents of Santa Ana. And the, co the college has basically reneged on that decision. We need you to get that parkland back for us at some point. Think of all the magnificent things that could be there. I'll move on. This weekend, in Centennial, in, across from Centennial Park, actually in Windsor Village Park, it's on the corner of Shawnee and uh, Nakoma Streets, there's going to be a graffiti paint out from 7 until 10. We encourage the community to come out, help paint out the graffiti, help get rid of that scourge of graffiti that's plaguing our community and get to know some of the neighbors and get to know some of the people from that community there. Once again, it's on, on the corner of Shawnee and Nakoma from 7 to 10 on Saturday morning. And it's a graffiti, oh, 9. Starts or ends? 9 to 12. Okay, 9 to 12 on Saturday morning. So we encourage people to come out. We encourage all of you to come out. And last, let me just say something about your 85A item. All of us have to work hard to put these events on during the city. We often reach into our own pockets. I do it for the zoo, I do it for neighborhood associations, I do it for nonprofits. It's not a problem for any of you to reach into any of your pocket. It would not be a violation, it would not require city policy. Any of you can support the neighborhoods anytime you want. So people will probably be asking. Thank you, good evening. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for doing everything that you do. And now we're on to city manager's comments. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, uh, Mayor uh, Pro Tem, members of the City Council. I want to emphasize how important it is to wipe out graffiti in our parks, and I also uh, want the public to know, as, uh, as Steve just mentioned, that from 9 to noon this Saturday at Windsor Park, 85 people are already registered, uh, and they will be painting uh, young people uh, the, uh, the graffiti that's there and also will be doing beautification, and it also is a partnership with the PAL program, and they have uh, additional people registered, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Thank you for those comments. And I'm sure we'll have a much healthier crowd than that after that announcement. And uh, moving on to council member comments, I'll move. start with my left, uh, council member Amesqua. Thank you, Mayor Portem. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, thank staff. I made a call and I was very impressed with uh, graffiti removal. Now that we're talking about graffiti removal, there was a wall that had graffiti across the street from Edison and they actually went out on the same day and removed it. So thank you very much. Um, also, I do want to wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day. I know that's coming up, and uh, we won't be we won't have another council meeting before then. So, happy Valentine's Day to everyone! And um, finally, I do just want to mention really quick. I think we're all here concerned about safety in our parks, and I know we heard a lot of speakers. And I'd like to thank everyone that came out to speak on that. And um, I, I just do want to make it clear that I think we are all. Uh, in favor of just keeping our parks safe, whether it was our option C, option A, you know, a combination. Um, I think we're going to move forward and we're going to do what's right and keep them safe. So um, thank you, City Manager. I know you worked hard on that, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilmember Reyna. Yes, thank you so very much. Like always, uh, we live in a desert, so make sure you conserve water as often as you possibly can. Water your grass at night. 
uh, do whatever you can to p could contribute. Thank you so very much on that part. <clears throat> Coming up in our city at, at Santa Ana College, April 18th and 19th, is uh, the city of Santa Ana is uh, partnering up with the Relay for Life and hosting a, an event. Uh, this is a great opportunity for the community to come together. It, it transcends every line that you could think out of there, whether it be north of 17, south of 17, male, female, Republican, Democrat, anybody else. Cancer affects every single person out there. And if we can't put our differences aside to fight the, the, the greater uh, uh, challenges and these greater issues, what are we really doing? I encourage you to get involved, come by and visit, see what's going on, join a team, create a team. If you're not quite sure, join my team, with Team Santa Ana. Uh, please get involved. You can, you can sign up online, and that's at uh, Relay for Life Santa Ana. And on that aspect, you can kind of join our team or with any other team you want. I know we've already have some commitments and some donations uh, from, from our staff and our colleagues, so I definitely appreciate that. Challenge you guys to get out there and walk at least an hour. In uh, saying so, uh, the youth and government program that I volunteer for all the time is getting ready to go to Sacramento for its model legislation and court conference. Uh, they'll be taking over the, cap the state capitol, debating in the Senate and Assembly chambers, and kicking the governor out of his office as well. We'll be up there February 12th to 16th. The, the bill that our team is carrying up is you need to have a high school diploma in order to get a driver's license. And so that's the bill that our team is taking up this year, so I wish all of our delegates good luck. Uh, Valentine's is coming up real quick. Unfortunately, I'll be in Sacramento, so Pia, let me tell you right now, I love you, uh, and you'll get your gift before I leave. Uh, and in saying so, please shop downtown Santa Ana. We have some great uh, jewelry shops. Uh, Valencia Jewelry has been in this community for a very long time. Keep investing in Santa Ana. The ripple effects are absolutely incredible. Thanks so very much. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Benavides. Thank you, Mayor Portem. I'll assume that you purchased that gift uh, in, in Santa Ana, uh, Councilman Reina. Uh, I want to thank everybody who came out and uh, participated in, the, in the, just the democratic process here in the city, uh, engaged and uh, communicating to us, residents in particular, con communicating to the city, city council, your priorities, your interests, uh, uh, needs, concerns. Uh, it, it's, it's important to be able to have an engaged community, and uh, particularly the uh, park uh, ranger issue and program, something that was clearly important to, to a lot of you. So thank you for taking the time uh, to come and share that before us. Uh, also, uh, you know, there, there's a number of residents within the city who have increasingly become engaged in, in the issue of addressing uh, the challenge of homelessness in our city. Susana, thank you for your comments. I have visited the uh, uh, Illumination Foundation, impressed with, with the work. I know Councilman Reyna has, I believe maybe a couple of other council members uh, have as well, and hopeful that whether it be uh, Illumination Foundation, Mercy House, or a number of others uh, that are doing some good work out there, ultimately that we will uh, actually find some solutions and, and get some, some traction, get some, some work done. And our city manager sits on the, on the uh, uh, task force for homelessness, and, and uh, he has been very engaged in, in uh, trying to work with the county to come up with, with some solutions. Just want to encourage uh, him and, our, and, and Alma Flores from city manager's office to continue to help us uh, uh, figure out how we can actually respond to some of the issues and, and needs out there. Uh, the, there's a lot of uh, a lot going on within our city always. That's one of the things that I love about our, about our great city. I want to reiterate the, the uh, graffiti paint out day this coming Saturday. Uh, uh, just uh, the, the passion and commitment and, and volunteerism of, of our uh, of our city and its residents is is, is always encouraging. And uh, next Saturday as well on, on the 14th, uh, there's there was a, a gentleman earlier that was here part of the uh, the receiving the, an exceptional service award, uh, Pastor Gail Oliver, who referenced the Love Santa Ana initiative. Uh, there is uh, on the 14th in the Willard neighborhood will be a, a number of uh, volunteers from throughout the city also des descending upon that neighborhood uh, starting at 7.30 in the morning uh, there at Willard at Intermediate. Uh, there will be uh, groups going out doing a, a neighborhood cleanup, painting some of the uh, uh, apartment buildings out there and homes that need some help, uh, f uh, fences and doing some, some gardening and such. So I want to encourage folks to come out and participate in that as well. Uh, if you're on Facebook, uh, there's a Facebook page, the Love Santa Ana Initiative. Um, the Love Santa Ana Initiative on Facebook. I want to encourage folks to come out and be, be uh, participants in that uh, uh, effort of volunteerism and just loving in our city. Um, that same day, February 14th, Valentine's Day, just want to encourage folks to uh, share love, caring, and, uh, and, and, and affection. And, and if you do that through purchasing gifts, that you do that and that you shop in our city. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilwoman Martinez.
Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Sarmiento, finally getting not saying Mayor Pro Tem Dina Harrell, now I can say Mayor Pro Tem Sarmiento. It's, it's hard for people to get over me. Right? It certainly is. So charming and good looking. Just, oh my goodness. On a great note, you know, it's always great to have a sense of humor, and I'm glad that uh, Councilman Dina Harrell is sitting next to me. Certainly had fun with. Uh, uh, once upon a time, uh, as I sat on the other side, I had Carlos Bustamante next to me, and then I, I sat next to Councilman Benavides, and I sat next to Councilman Sarmiento, and now Dina Hedo. I don't know, maybe next year I'll be between Roman and, and, and Angie, I don't know, but it, it's really great to, 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 to sit next to um, Councilman Dina Hedo, because I, I, I may not agree with him all the time, but... He's always going to state how he feels, and I think that's important for all of us to have our own opinions. And even though we may not agree with them, but they were able to express them, and that's very important. And so I just want to thank you, Sal, even though we're not on the same page here today. You know, you, you said your piece, and um, I, I welcome it. I think it's healthy uh, for us as a council, but um, as a community as a whole. Um, I want to, um, one, um, acknowledge the month of February is Black History Month, and I want to thank um, um, our mayor and Councilman um, Benavides for um, acknowledging the African American community here, not just in Santa Ana, but in Orange County. Um, you know, um, it's a community that has had roots in this in this city, and um, I've always had a very close heart to the uh, you know with the African American community. Um, and um, I just think that it's great for us to be as diverse and being willing to be supportive of, of different ethnicities. And so I just thought it was a, a, um, really good for us to, to be here and support the African-American community. Um, we also, in the month of February, are, uh, are celebrating um, the... Um, the Tet Festival and Tet, which is the Lunar uh, New Year, and uh, we have a 16% uh, uh, Vietnamese community here in the city of Santa Ana, and this year the Tet Festival will be in Costa Mesa, and uh, it is my hope that um, not only the Black History Parade, but also making a commitment to bringing the Tet Festival to the city of Santa Ana. Um, as we embrace diversity, we have Fiestas Patrias, we have Cinco de Mayo, I think it's very important to integrate all these cultures together and because that's what makes the city of Santa Ana very special. Um, you know, as we celebrate the, um, you know, 4th of July, you know, this is something that I think for a very long time, not only um, a couple council members up here uh, wanting to support, um, you know, 4th of July, but the community, you know, also wanting to make sure that we continue to have those events and celebrating, you know, the birth of, of, of the U.S. And so I just want to thank the, the residents just all out there. They are always holding us accountable to making sure that we're inclusive and wanting to celebrate as many holidays as possible here in the city. Um, that's what makes Santa Ana very special. Um, next, I just wanted to um, indicate that I um, went um, to Sacramento uh, two weeks ago, and I was supposed to announce, uh, I sit on the California League of Cities Orange County Division. In particular, I am appointed by the state board to be on the Transportation, Public Works, and Technology Committee. And I was there two weeks ago. I briefed our city manager on some of the major issues and also our public works. I do want to bring up one particular issue. A lot of the issues are very technical, but one that really hit close to me. And... Um, wanting to make sure that my colleagues will be able to address this with me as well as we move forward. Um, and that is an issue. There is certain legislation up right now as it pertains to the axles and how much of the buses uh, weigh and, and the wear and tear that a lot of um, you know the, the buses of OCTA are putting out on our roads and the deterioration. Each axle is supposed to weigh uh, 16,000 pounds. Of, um, unfortunately, OCTA is way over that, especially when they're at peak hours. So you could imagine you know, the, the, the constraints that they're really putting on our roads, and they really don't pay the city of Santa Ana to maintain those roads. And so that's an issue that we need to pay very close attention to. There's legislation out there um, um, at that moment in, um, in time in Sacramento, and I really believe that um, we really need to pay close attention. So, uh, Mr. City Manager, if, as we look forward to our legislative platform, I, I want us to um, bring that to the attention to our lobbyists and to see how we can be supportive on that issue 
and I attended the OCTA um, uh, bike safety meeting as well, and there were a couple of legislative issues that I think that we can be supportive as well. Um, and, um, and I don't have those at the top of my, um, my head here, but there was two issues that um, I would hope that uh, we could address those in the legislative committee and put in, um, and see if we can make it part of our platform. Um, next, I actually um, was also in Sacramento again uh, for an interview. I um, will be in the consent calendar on February 19 for the state uh, California League of Cities to, um, to be a board member. Um, at large, three out of 41 uh, elected officials applied for that position, and I, I, I of, and two others uh, will be on the consent calendar on February 19 to be on that board of directors for the California League of Cities. I'm very excited. This is the first time someone from the city of Santa Ana will be able to be a representative and really pay close attention of what's happening in the state of California that affects us here every single day, in particular issues of, of homelessness, uh, public transportation, housing. These are all issues that um, we consistently are battling with and even though we do pay for lobbyists, it's important for us as an elected body to be up there and having conversation with, um, uh, um, with the legislators up there. And there certainly has been a huge shift of legislators that are representing us, and uh, many of them are very freshmen. And so having to be part of the league and going up there with many other elected officials and really advocating to making sure that we have local control and that we're being supportive of these uh, uh, issues issues that uh, face um, local municipalities every day. So I'm extremely excited to be a part of that um, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, finally, I wanted to um, take the opportunity to thank all the youth that applied to be on youth commissions. And I see some of, of the young folks over there from the teen space and the library and just want to thank them because I know they had a lot to do with that. And 11 youth in Ward 2 have applied and so I have asked um, our staff to, to, to uh, review that. I will be making some recommendations and hopefully making appointments at the next city council meeting. So just wanting to um, let you know, I did send a couple emails out to a couple of the um, youth that uh, sent emails personally to me. I responded, and so I should have a response within uh, mid-next week of who I will be appointing. But I just want to thank you for really wanting to participate and hoping that as we get new youth, youth commissioners that we will activate this youth commission. This is very exciting to know. I, I know I received only, I received 11, but there were a lot more applications. And then I'm hoping that my colleagues who do not have current appointments that you will fill those. Of, um, our clerk sent uh, many of those. And so I will have a lot um, as well since I could only pick two. Um, and so I, I hope that uh, we will be able to fill uh, that youth commission and making sure that they'll be able to participate as our other uh, commissions have. Um, so it's an exciting time um, um, for us and young people wanting to be engaged in the process. And with that being said, um, I guess happy Valentine's Day. Um, you know, I'm not married, I'm not with anyone, but I do, uh, you know, believe that uh, Valentine's Day is not about just celebrating uh, Valentine's Day with your significant other or your wife, or, but I really believe that love, uh, you know, goes beyond, um, you know, just wanting to just share it with one individual that you have a relationship with. Love is universal, and I think that uh, we all should always express you know, love with everyone. We are all human, and I think that's what connects us is love. And so with that being said, have a great Valentine's Day. Thank you, council member. I think friendship is a good thing, you know? Friendship. Right? Exactly, exactly. There's then I'm a holiday for that. There's a holiday, another one. Uh, council member, former mayor pro tem, Dina right. Hedl. Well, uh, first of all, I think I'm gonna start a new company called uh, singlecitycouncilmembers.com. <laughs> I think. I think that might work. I didn't think about that one. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Council Member Martinez, for your uh, tireless work. And uh, it is befitting that you have that, uh, that opportunity to represent us up at the League of Cities. Uh, what I was just kind of reminiscing, because tonight has been a rough night for me. It's been, I'm, I'm, I'm going to admit it's been a rough one. 
Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think that uh, what, what makes it, it, it's not so much that it's a rough night, but it's also a, a night that I will celebrate as well because when we first, uh, in 2006, when four of us pretty much were elected to this council, uh, there wasn't much transparency. Uh, when a developer wanted to build somewhere, they went through the process, and it wasn't until the very end, when it was almost at the end of the process, that they went to the community. And then the community would always say, we didn't know about this development. Why didn't we find out about this? I don't know if you remember, but driving your car through the city of Santa Ana back in 2006, it was not uncommon for you to get a flat tire because sometimes you would hit a pothole or your car would just fall into the pothole. It was like the Grand Canyon out here. And uh, what this council came in, we did some, some things that others hadn't, uh, thought of, and that is we went out on a bond. We were able to pave not 100 but 200 uh, residential streets. We were able to um, come in and start to create a transparency within the city that was going to be effective. It wasn't easy. It was a lot of hard work. Uh, when this council needed to make a tough decision to keep the city afloat, we did that. Um, and uh, when the council needed to make a change at the helm, we did that, and it was not easy. This council has been through a lot of, uh, through an amazing roller coaster ride. But along the way, look at what we've been able to get from it as a community. We have a transparency, uh, a sunshine ordinance that gives us transparency at all levels. You can get more information from documents from our clerk than ever before. Things are online. Meetings are online. We meet here every other week versus meeting here one week here and another week in a different location. Uh, we went from a $3 million surplus, or reserve, I apologize, reserve, to a four, over a $42 million surplus. We have money, or reserve, we have money now to help create reinforce our infrastructure and at the same time treat our, our employees and, and pay them what they're worth. That is a huge, huge uh, feather in everyone's cap as we go forward. When Forbes magazine is ranking us as one of the top coolest cities in America and our downtown, Orange, Cal Orange, County, or Orange Coast magazine names our downtown as the best downtown, um, I was talking to a member from one of the South County cities. I don't want to say who it was. And uh, they, that individual said, you know, what you guys are doing in Santa Ana is pretty incredible. It went from where people didn't want to go to Santa Ana, where, where young people are saying, we're going to go hang out in Santa Ana, where the real housewives of Orange County are coming to your restaurants in Santa Ana and filming. I said, yeah, I know. I haven't seen one, but I've heard they've been out here. Um, I don't want to uh, introduce myself because I think they might like me too much. So I, I try to stay away. But anyhow, um, <laughs> so the, the, where, where I want to wrap up here is, is that it has taken a huge uh, amount of work from many people on this council. And those that have come in after have decided that they want to get on this bandwagon and make the city better. And, and Council Member Martinez and I agree about 90% of the time. And so, but there are issues tonight that we didn't agree on, and that's democracy. That's what we do, is to bring ideas to the forefront, and at the end of the day, we take a vote. And the responsible thing is, when you take the vote and you're not on the winning end, you shake it off and you go, okay, whatever won, whatever prevailed, how can we make it better? And I think that's where, where the maturity and leadership comes in as well. So I just want to thank all my colleagues because we've come a long way. But the beauty of it is we have, for some of us, we have four more years to continue that legacy, to continue those goals. And let's keep our eye on that prize and continue to serve our city to the best of the ability that we can. And I want to say happy Valentine's Day to, every, to everyone. Uh, I'm like you. I'm going to be in Hav I'm going to be at Harvard. You know, Harvard. I can't say Harvard. It's Harvard. When you get there, it's Harvard. With my speech and debate team, and we're going to go out and try to do some damage out there. Well, thank you. Good night. Thank you, Council Member. And it's always hard to follow. Uh, Council Member Athena Hedo, because he always speaks so well on every topic. But um, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight, and those of you who are following us on TV. I want to thank our staff for all the reports and all the information that you provided us as well. Um,
I'm on the Orange County Water District right now representing the city and there's an issue that's coming before us and it's been before us for quite a while. It's a proposed desalination plant in Huntington Beach and it's intended to provide another um, uh, resource for water and, and diversify our portfolio there. It's a very controversial issue but it's going to be something that's been before um, the uh, district board there and it'll be coming before us again but what we've decided as, a, as an agency is to get some comments from the community so there's a citizens advisory committee that's been that's in the process of being convened so um, if anybody's interested please go on the Orange County Water District website and there's a way to pull down the application and submit it each member of the board has two selections in addition to an alternate to make so I'm looking at um, uh, applications I've received a couple already but if anybody's interested please feel free to go ahead and forward a copy of that for me and I'll be happy to take a look at it um, secondly I wanted to just thank um, uh, our chief of police and his staff because over the weekend uh, my car was broken into my wallet was stolen for the second time and um, you know right after I reported it I had um, you know the corporal a commander and a detective call me to follow up on this and and it's unfortunate but I know we've had a spree of of um, a theft in our neighborhood I know that um, a neighbor of mine had his daughter's bike stolen so uh, these things happen and we know that sometimes you know uh, you know we, we have a spike in some in some crime and so I just wanted to thank you chief and please uh, uh, thank detective Romero for me um, and 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 Corporal Lima, who I spoke with, and they were on the phone with me many times, just gathering reports and claims that I made for um, for lost uh, lost lost uh, property. So we've got a great staff; they're very responsive, and I appreciate everything that they've done over the weekend. Um, I wanted to um, adjourn uh, in memory of a former uh, member of the city family that passed recently, and his name was uh, Edmundo Ed Martinez Jr. And if you'll uh, just uh, indulge me in, in, in me uh, speaking about uh, a little bit about Edmundo. Edmundo, uh, known also as Eddie and Ed, was born September 15, 1959 in Plainview, Texas. He was the eldest of seven children. His family moved to Santa Ana when he was nine years old. Growing up in Santa Ana, he aspired to one day work for the Santa Ana Police Department. That dream was fulfilled on September 1st, 1992, when he was hired as one of the original correctional supervisors for the new Santa Ana uh, jail at that time. He wore that patch proudly. He worked for the city um, for 21 years and retired on December 29th, 2013. Prior to working for the police department here, Ed served his country in both the Army and the Marines. Ed is survived by his loving wife, Maria, of 30 years, who also works at the Santa Ana Police Department and Human Resources. His sons are Edmund and Isaac, his daughter, Annalisa, and grandson, Dominic, who will turn two next month. He had many great friends here in the city of Santa Ana, and he will be greatly missed. We extend our deepest condolences to the Martinez family. We'd like us to all adjourn in his memory, and with that, have a good night.